Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get our, our program started and want to welcome everyone here, and I'm sure we're going to have other people come in as the morning evolves and people finish making rounds or and or getting over last night, uh, as the case might be. Um, we're really happy to have everybody here. I'm pretty sure that I'm right in saying that this is the 29th um, McCravey Lecture uh, and therefore alumni homecoming event. Uh, we always welcome back uh, people who come from some distance away to be here. We don't we don't get everybody, but we get everybody we can. And saw Matt Fye back there. Matt, we're really happy to have you back. Uh, from down in uh, Decatur, uh, Huntsville, Alabama area. Um, I don't see others other than our local faculty at this point. <clears throat> uh, the, the, while I'm going through a few things, let me just mention that the cocktail reception at the Weston starts at 6 this evening. And uh, Dr. Witherspoon, remind me, and I'll try to do it again, that at 1 o'clock today, there's a, for those who don't want to play golf, there is a swim party at uh, Mary Catherine Huddleston's mother's place, which you can get directions from Dr. Witherspoon if you need to, to, to be there. So you're welcome for that. Um, we want to extend, extend a special welcome to our new house staff coming in, our residents. We're really pleased to have you here and Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Sharp just uh, remarked a minute ago that he thought that was a nice touch and we really are happy you're here and want you to enjoy the, the day and the evening and get some idea of the flavor and culture of the program uh, going in. Um, I think uh, without further ado we'll probably go ahead and get started. We always do this by warming up the crowd with uh, with one of our chief talks that we'll have today. I uh, would want to mention that Alan Hyde was gracious enough to, uh, and his family was gracious enough for us to do his chief talk this last Wednesday, uh, as it just compresses the program too much if we try to do too many talks uh, on the Saturday morning. And he gave a great talk on rectal cancer and um, really appreciate him doing that. We're going to lead off this morning with Tim Stevens. Uh, all the residents here know that Tim's a native of Ohio. Uh, his family is here, and we got to meet them and spend some time with them last night. And we really appreciate you getting up and being here this morning, and and we appreciate you sharing Tim with us over the last six years. Uh, when <clears throat> when he finishes uh, today or tomorrow this weekend, he's going on down to. Birmingham to do a uh, fellowship in critical care, trauma critical care surgery. Um, we've kind of made him a southerner uh, by virtue of him coming here and finding a nice lady to uh, plan to spend the rest of his life with and have children and I guess that's going to make it hard for him to get out of uh, the south uh, long term. Uh, in, talking about the, in talking about the titles for these talks, um, I was really fascinated when he came up independently with what you see as his title there, which is the role of general surgeon in delivering bad news. And, you know, that's one of the things that when you, when you take on the mantle of a surgeon, you just have to realize that that's going to be a part of what you do take on. Uh, but this is the first time I've seen anybody really put that together uh, as a topic of a talk. So I'm especially looking forward to it, and uh, I think it's a good way to, to start off this uh, meeting this morning. So, Tim, look forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Dr. Burns, and again, thank you to all the uh, incoming residents for taking the time to be here, as well as all the family and staff. And today I'm going to talk about, um, like you said, the role of the general surgeon in breaking bad news to patients and how we integrate that into their aftercare. I have no disclosures for this talk. Uh, the objectives for today, I'm going to go over a little bit about the history of this in medicine, our role as surgeons in delivering bad news, how we experience this during our medical education, uh, specifically talk about error and adverse event disclosure, and then have some time for discussion afterwards. 
So why do I want to talk about something like this? It's obviously not, you know, an upbringing subject, uh, but it's pretty much unavoidable in what we do. Um, as it said, to err is human. And in fact, nearly one in 10 patients will experience an adverse event during their time um, in medical care. Uh, as surgeons, we get entwined in a unique combination of acute and chronic illnesses, oncology and trauma. And as physicians, um, we pretty much all think the end of life discussions are important, but less than a third of us end up having any training in this. And as a result, patients often end up being ill-informed about their care, and we'll see some of the effects of that. Uh, for me specifically, I uh, can't remember the first time I was compared to my buddy Eeyore over here, but uh, I tend to have pretty straightforward outlook on things, uh, try not to be flustered a whole lot. Um, this was something that I thought about a lot during medical school as I um, entertained the idea of going into surgery if I could handle conversations like this and tough issues with patients. Um, on a bit more of a positive note, I like to spin it as stoicism. Um, this is probably one of my favorite scenes from uh, the classics and the Aeneid. This is Aeneas carrying out his father and his son from the burning city of Troy, and this is his wife who in fact ends up dying as they escape. And when they land shipwrecked on an island, all his men look up to him and he realizes as this young man that he needs to show them some sort of leadership. And he says to them that your task is to endure and save yourselves for better days. And in the Latin, it's very beautiful how they end up wording this and that these were his words, but he was sick with all his cares and he showed them the face of hope and kept his misery deep in his heart. And that's, that's a heavy thought, but I think that's something that all physicians go through is that we have to have these difficult conversations with patients, but they still look to us as their leaders and um, as their physicians. So a bit of the history of delivering bad news, uh, Hippocrates in his chapter on prognostic, um, he briefly touches on this and states that if he, the physician, has foreknowledge and declares beforehand at his patient's bedside both the present, the past, and the future, Filling in the details they have omitted, it will be believed that he has a better understanding of their cases so that they will have the confidence to entrust themselves to him as their doctor. Um, he essentially goes on to describe that the physician's role is to gain the trust of their patient so they'll keep them as their doctor. Uh, he also goes so far as to say if you think your patient's not going to make it, that you need to make sure they know that um, ahead of time, which was pretty advanced for the ancients. Um, kind of the negative to this behind the scenes is that this was the only way they would get any business. They had to prove that all their outcomes and predictions would be true. Um, and this is kind of the start of this idea of uh, benevolent non-disclosure. And this carried on um, in 1847 when the AMA was created in their code of ethics. Um, they essentially say that you don't want to make any gloomy prognostications um, and be, uh, be the savior of empiricism. But he should not fail on proper occasions to give to the friends of the patient timely notice of danger when it really occurs, and even to the patient himself if absolutely necessary. For the physician should be the minister of hope and comfort to the sick. Um, here we start seeing a type of paternalism in medicine where they think that giving hope to the patient is the best way to have a positive outcome. But at the same time, um, again, they needed to have positive outcomes to maintain business and keep getting more patients. And this persisted for at least 50 years um, when they rewrote their ethics and started mentoring, mentioning more about cancer. They still maintain that really you want to keep your patients in ignorance to all of this. Um, otherwise, they'll have worse outcomes. Uh, a little bit later, William Osler started to touch on the difficulty of having these conversations, noting that it's a hard matter uh, to tell a patient that he's past all hope and referenced Sir Thomas Brown saying that it's the hardest stone you can throw at a man to tell him that he is at the end of his tether. And again, they think this was because if you destroyed the patient's hope, then they wouldn't have a chance of recovering. Um, and this kind of had ongoing outcomes, and there was a survey in 1961, and at that time, 90% of physicians did not want to disclose cancer diagnoses to their patients. Um, at the same time, Glazer, who's a pretty prominent sociologist, was working in the, in the VA system and wrote a paper on what he thought uh, fed into this. And he stated that few doctors get to know each terminal patient well enough to judge his desire for disclosure uh, or his capacity to withstand the shock of disclosure. Some doctors simply feel unable to handle themselves well enough during disclosure, and others do not tell them because they do not want the patient to lean on them for emotional support or because they simply wish to preserve the peace on the ward by preventing a scene. 
And this is one of the first instances where people started to note kind of doctors' feelings on the subject and what could be um, inhibitors to us having a good um, open communication with our patients. Throughout the 60s and 70s, we see a paradigm shift from this paternalism to a more partnership-based um, system in medical ethics. And there were a few really big changes, both socially and ethically, that brought this about. Uh, we saw the advent and expansion of Medicare and Medicaid, the passage of the Civil Rights Bill. Uh, there were a handful of very large ethical transgressions in medicine that came about. You had researchers injecting cancer cells into patients and not telling them. Uh, we transplanted chimpanzee kidneys into patients without consent. And the Tuskegee, Tuskegee syphilis study, which occurred in the 30s, uh, was brought to the public light in the 70s. Um, for those who don't know, it's a major issue in ethics where patients with syphilis were withheld uh, a known working treatment of penicillin to study their outcomes and weren't told any of this. And interestingly enough, at the same time, both hospice and palliative care were developed as uh, specialties. And in the literature, we start to see a shift in um, the verbiage that physicians were using. In 1963, Nahum did note that it is our responsibility to have no hesitation, and frankly, but tactfully, and at the correct time, answering questions asked by the patient. And we see a new goal of being truthful with the patient, but still trying to avoid major emotional upset. And this kind of new idea of thinking and talking with the patient pers persisted throughout the late 60s into the 70s. And a fairly interesting study in 1979 reused the same questionnaire from 1961. And at this point, there was a turnaround, and 90% um, of physicians at the time preferred to disclose cancer diagnoses, which is the complete opposite of what they had found 18 years prior. And whether they knew it or not, these dashing young gentlemen were all part of this change in the 70s. And I didn't have much of a reason to put this in other than that I love these pants, and I wish they could make a comeback. So as we move into today's time, um, we see a lot more um, articles and discussion on how to talk with patients, how to have open-ended discussions, how to give bad news. Uh, both the Institute of Medicine and National Cancer Institute uh, put out huge papers on how to give these talks. Um, in 2014, the Institute of Medicine again put out an entire report focused on end-of-life care, and especially how to discuss bad news. So you think with all of this, we've figured things out and switched it around, but when we actually look at how it turns out, you know, newer studies um, in 2016, only 5% of cancer patients accurately understood their prognoses well enough to make informed details about their care. Uh, There's another study that showed that 80% of patients with metastatic colon cancer thought that palliative therapy meant they could be cured. Um, and this was actually just in national news last week. Uh, article titled Never Say Die, Why So Many Doctors Won't Break Bad News. And in this, the physician himself, Dr. Nato, um, he kind of figured out on his own that he had pancreatic cancer because he knew what the results of his own tests meant. Um, but he had a colleague who initially was doing his workup and he felt that he simply did not want to tell me. And then he underwent this pretty tragic time where he heard about his diagnosis from the doorway as they discussed it outside with a medical student. Um, and I think it's important to note that, you know, he says a month later, uh, the shock remained fresh, and we'll see how this ongoing feeling um, persists with our patients. And it's kind of an example of what our patients go through. And for those of you who haven't seen Breaking Bad, uh, Walter White here is a rather intelligent uh, chemist who is incidentally diagnosed with cancer uh, when he has a coughing fit and passes out. And this is him as he gets his first talk about it. need to make sure you fully understand. Best case scenario with chemo, I'll live maybe another couple of years. It's just 
You've got mustard on your... I have to get mustard there. Right there? So, uh, that scene touched on a few things that we're going to go over now. Um, you know, there's been quite a few uh, post-event interviews, especially with trauma victims and their families. Um, one of these uh, reports noted that these survivors really rated high clarity of information and privacy as being most important for them when they're having these conversations. Um, they didn't want any sugarcoating or delaying of the news. Uh, another similar study uh, ranked what patients think is the most important features when they have these talks with us. Uh, most importantly for them was the attitude of the news giver, and you're going to see that this really persists through most studies. Um, they want clarity in the message, privacy. They want their questions to be able to be answered. Um, ironically, even though that guy had his mustard stain, most of them don't care about what we're wearing. Um, sympathy, um, time for the questions, and location weren't as important. And I thought what was interesting in this as well is that 30% of respondents didn't want any sort of touching, whether that was on a shoulder or hand holding, which is um, often recommended as something to do, as we'll see here. Um, there's another study, um, patients' perspectives and opinions on delivering bad news. This study is from Poland, so there are some differences um, because of their half of their system is socialized healthcare, and they look into differences with that as well. But uh, what was good about this study is it really had a wide range of disease processes, not just cancer. There was um, chronic pancreatitis, chronic um, abdominal issues and traumas, and um, a wider range of medical specialists were um, studied and how they gave bad news, including surgeons. And what they looked at in this um, was the patient's decision-making after receiving their news, and less than half, um, or just about half, wanted to continue their medical care with the doctor who gave them this news. Um, and more than half either wanted to change the doctor giving their therapy or completely withdrew from therapy. And they found an association with this on how the patients felt the news was delivered, uh, which is important um, in all of this and that, you know, how we end up having these first conversations can really change how our patients choose to continue or change their care. Um, so what's our role in all of this? Um, on a survey of surgeons um, by telephone, they were able to break it down into essentially three different methods that we use, um, whether we know it or not. Uh, the majority of us end up using a forecasting strategy where there's a stage delivery. Um, after a minute or two, um, we kind of warn our patients and then move on to the information. A uh, surprising amount are pretty blunt about it and just go straight to the problem uh, without any context. And then a, a smaller percentage uh, delay and kind of get caught up in all the details and beat around the bush before we get to the bad news. So is there a standardized way that we should be doing this? Um, some people think so. Uh, this is the most prominent one in the literature. Uh, it's the Spikes method. It was developed in 1990 at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, it was initially a protocol for breaking bad news to cancer patients, um, and it's designed to include both what uh, physicians think is important in this and the patients from these prior um, studies that I just mentioned. Uh, the four main goals of this method are to gather information from the patient, and based on that, give them intelligible information based on what you've assessed their needs and desires to be. And after this part of the talk, then you need to support your patient um, by assessing their emotional needs, and then finally develop a combined strategy that includes the patient and their family. I'm not going to go over all of this, because um, this is all pretty accessible, um, but I think these are important to touch upon, because uh, I think most of this really does work to help put the patient at ease. Um, so the S of spikes is for setting up the interview. Uh, as we mentioned, privacy is important for our, a lot of our patients. You want to make some sort of connection with sitting down in eye contact. Again, uh, a lot of studies mention touching the patient, but like that uh, survey noted, many patients don't actually want that, so that's kind of a thing you have to measure on your own. Um, I think in our time, uh, managing time constraints and interruptions is very important. Uh, we all have pagers, phones, and smartwatches that go off. Um, if you can, I think we're pretty good here at giving them to other people or having someone else in the room take that for you. But I think warning a patient that you know things come up and we'll do our best is important as well. 
Uh, the peeing spikes is for perception, and this is where you analyze what the patient knows and what you need to tell them about. Um, one of my favorite things to ask patients is, what have you been told about your medical situation so far? And this isn't just for bad news. I think you can gain a lot by letting the patient try to describe to you what's going on, and then you fill in the blanks for them. Um, the eye is for essentially evaluating what you've just talked about and seeing what the patient wants to receive back as far as the depth of information. Um, and these two, there's been studies on how well we do the spikes protocol as physicians as whole, and the P and the I are generally where we do the worst. Um, the K is for knowledge. Um, this is how you present the bad news. As I noted before, there's kind of three main methods that physicians end up falling into. Um, you really do want to give them some sort of warning and a delay so they can start to take in information. Um, although you don't want to be too technical, with some words, they, most patients do want a full um, disclosure of everything that they can get. Um, bluntness is bad at first, um, and that, uh, that can cause an anger response where the patients will look at you with that and not really want you to participate in their care. Um, taking small breaks and do, using chunks of information is important as well. Uh, the E is for emotions and the empathic response, and this is how you evaluate how they're responding and what you can do to support them at this time. A lot of times this can be aided with um, a statement where you're, you express to them that you are understanding that they're sad and that you wish this could be better. Um, really, this is just on a patient-to-patient -patient basis. And finally, with the S is your strategy and summary, and this is where after this talk, and this can all be broken up, this doesn't have to be one episode with the patient. Um, you don't have to go in order, you can skip steps, bounce around, whatever works best for each patient. Um, is where you make your treatment plan and include them in that decision making is the most important part of this. And this is where you can double check that they've understood everything else you've done up to this point. So does it work? Um, the SPICE protocol has been looked at um, a lot in Europe, um, as well as across specialties, not just in oncology. Um, there's a couple uh, pediatric surgery studies on it, GYN studies. Um, as I mentioned, we're pretty good except for the perception and um, emotional assessment of patients in it. Patients themselves, even if they get all the information through this, um, like that first survey I mentioned, what ends up being most important is how the physician presented it to them and what the physician's um, personality was and how they got the point across. So even if they're using a protocol and they hit all these marks, it's really up to how the presenter did it in the first place. So how are we taught this as we go through our medical education? Um, in medical school, uh, most often it's standardized patients. That's what I had at the University of Cincinnati. I talked with the students who come through here. They also have a standardized patient day where they talk to one or two um, patients and practice giving them bad news. Um, that's the most common method. Some people will watch videos and go through modules. There's not much of a curriculum for that. Um, as residency um, advances, uh, for us here, and I'm going to talk more about this, um, we get the opportunity to accompany our attendings, and there's this ongoing apprentice apprenticeship model, uh, which ends up being extremely important for this. Um, at our program here, we have a lot of autonomy as the trauma chief and, and our uh, resident-run Orange Clinic. And these are huge opportunities where we get to have this one-on-one -on -one interaction with our patients and really work on this with them. Um, it's usually a private setting, either in the office um, or a, um, a room in the ER. And um, I can't express enough the experience that we get and how important that will be for all of you as you advance on. Um, and then we also have a morbidity and mortality conference, which I was in charge of organizing during my chief year. And I think here we do a really good job of making that an, an open discussion. Um, you're going to see some studies here in a second where that's not prevalent across um, all programs. Um, as part of our learning, there are milestones we're supposed to hit that are put out um, by the ACGME and other organizations. And hidden within um, interpersonal and communication skills, at one point, there is note of bad news. Um, I looked into this, and aside from surgery and the GYN milestones, those are the only two specialties that even mention bad news in their milestones. Um, so again, it's, it's known that it's something we know we should do and that we want to be better at, but it's not especially prominent in our um, established curriculum. And uh, 
like I said, standardized patients are pretty much the norm these days, and there's been studies on if this helps or not, and it seems at least on basic scoring systems they do. They can improve resident communication and uh, medical student communication, but it's hard to assess if this actually translates into real-world um, outcomes. Um, one of the more interesting studies is this group here looked at um, if communication skills change if there's family present and they had standardized patients not just with the patient but with a standardized family member as well um, and they found that that had an extra um, increase in the resident's ability to communicate which I think is important because often we want family around or they are around for these discussions. So moving on to surgical errors, um, I found this quote while I was looking through the literature which I think is pretty pertinent to us since the, the drastic consequences of our mistakes, the repeated opportunities to make them, the uncertainty about our own culpability when results are poor, and the medical and societal denial that mistakes must happen all result in an intolerable paradox for the physician. As I started off this talk, you know, I mentioned this is something that's almost unavoidable. Um, it's estimated that medical errors lead to 400,000 deaths a year, and that's 43 million adverse events yearly uh, worldwide. And that ends up making medical errors as the third leading cause of death after heart disease and cancer. Um, as you might expect, a large majority of these are uh, related to operations, uh, almost 40%, and medication related are the second most common uh, result. So uh, there's been some surveys of residents and faculty at teaching centers, um, one by uh, Cal Gien and <laughs> His partners uh, found that 93% of physicians um, said they would disclose an error, but only 5% reported they, that they had actually done so. And given those numbers that I just mentioned, they obviously kind of inferred that you know, with this number of adverse events and errors that even if we're saying we want to, we might not be always disclosing enough to the patients. And um, Gallagher's study found that surgeons report a better intent to disclose these errors. Um, rather than medical specialists, but that we end up giving less information and we hardly ever use the word error when we're actually talking to patients. And if that. Um, so they've looked at patients' responses as well with um, errors, not just bad news, and it's very similar in that they want full disclosure. Um, they really want an explicit statement that says, you know, an error has happened, and then they want further details. Um, they want an explanation of what happened, how it happened. And then what's really important to patients is uh, future implications, and we'll go over this some more. Um, and what's notable is um, patients really want an apology. They don't just want an intent of regret. They want a true apology that says we know something happened and that um, we're at fault. Of course, there's concerns that this will lead to litigation. Um, these are three of the prominent folks in town, and as a side note, there's quite a turf war between these three. If you look into the news, um, these two are from Alabama, and this group takes a lot of offense that they're not local attorneys and has written uh, a fair number of articles about it. But um, more pertinent to us, 12% of injuries due to negligence will lead to litigation. The study that this came from, um, implied that this is not a large number. I think it depends on what side of the litigation you're on. Um, I don't think practicing defensive medicine helps when it comes to errors and adverse events. And what's interesting is when they did a review of um, plaintiff's depositions um, for reasons why they ended up in a lawsuit, uh, the error itself was hardly ever one of the reasons. Um, a lot of the time it had to do with physician communication or not feeling like they were supported or that anyone was around for them. Um, aside from these that are listed here, what does come up a lot is patients want to make sure that this doesn't happen again to someone else. Um, so again, how can we be better at this? Uh, you need to have this disclosure as soon as possible. Um, if they can, you want your patient to have a support person nearby, whether that's family, um, a friend, just someone else in the room with them so that they can recognize that something's happened as well. And what's important to know about all these events is even though this might happen acutely in the hospital, um, these are long-term events for these patients, as we'll see with a couple studies I'll bring up. And um, really, this should continue in an outpatient setting as well to communicate with them. So are we any good at this? Uh, so a study from 2016 looked at our disclosure of these events. Um, and we're fairly good at a large number of them. Um, as you can see, when it comes to explaining why they happened and expressing regret, uh, we're pretty good. Um, we're good at doing this early, and we can also discuss how we're going to treat any other problems. 
But as I mentioned, our patients really want an apology for this, and we're not especially good at that. Um, they also want to know whether or not these events were preventable to begin with, and they want to know more how this is not going to happen to another patient. And what's notable about these three areas where we're not very good, um, there was an association with surgeons who reported a more negative um, affect afterwards with these events in their own personal lives. They ended up being the ones who were worse at this discussion with their patients. So um, it's been noted now that there's a hidden curriculum in surgery and that role models for responding to medical errors end up playing a central role in influencing our attitudes about disclosure. And this is a little example of what some people might experience in residency. Again, I don't think this is our experience. Which team do you play for? Well, I'm Peach. Well, I was just wondering, because I couldn't figure out why you would throw home when we've got a two-run lead. You let the tiny run get on second, and we lost the lead because of you. Now you start using your head. That's not love that's three feet above your ass. Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Why don't you leave her alone, Jimmy? Oh, you zip it, Doris. Rogers Horsby was my manager, and he called me a talking pile of pig shit. And that was when my parents drove all the way down from Michigan to see me play the game. And did I cry? No. 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 And you know why? No. Because there's no crying in baseball. There's no crying in baseball. No crying. So again, I don't think that's what we go through, but some people might. Um, and so this study um, looked at that essentially, and this was through um, one medical system, but a handful of um, hospitals all under the same mantle. Um, and they surveyed both surgical and non-surgical residents, and surgical residents ended up reporting that uh, they more frequently observed a colleague to be treated harshly for an error. Um, they also felt that they would be treated harshly if they acknowledged an error, and that sometimes they might have to compromise their own values for dealing with medical errors at their institution. Um, they also expressed that they felt less free to express these concerns to other members of the team about medical errors in patient care. Uh, the same group ended up doing a national survey of trainees, and they looked at more at um, the influence of um, upper levels and attendings on this. And this is, I think, one of the most important studies I came across in that when um, we have more frequent exposure to positive role models instead of negative ones for responding to errors, um, we're going to have a better uh, outcome from our own education. So negative role modeling, as you might expect, ended up having more negative attitudes towards disclosure and uh, more likelihood of non-transparent behavior uh, when errors occurred. And what's especially interesting is even if you had positive role models, these negative ones tended to um, overshadow that. But the good news is that there were more reported positive role models than negative ones in this study. Um, so moving on to our patients with this again, uh, this was a meta-analysis that looked at surgical complications and long-term effects on our patients. Uh, 50 studies were looked at. And two-thirds of these found that patients who suffered a complication had worse post-operative psychosocial outcomes. And this was despite controlling for any preoperative um, psychosocial um, baselines or clinical and demographic factors. Uh, there were statistically significant lower physical and mental quality of life for these patients. And um, 18 of these studies found that at uh, more than a year out, these um, psychosocial outcomes persisted. And I, again, as I mentioned, I think this is why a long-term follow-up with these patients or their families is especially important. A large majority will have issues up to a year, and even some will have that going on after that. And these studies um, were across specialties, and a large amount were from the colorectal and cardiothoracic literature. And what was interesting in that is that this effect on our patients was seen both with major and minor adverse events. You might think that you know, patients who had a bowel leak or a heart attack after a surgery would be more likely to have these, but they found that you know, patients who simply went in and out of AFib or had a minor wound infection ended up reporting these uh, worse psychosocial outcomes. Um, and specifically to some trauma patients and surgical accidents, uh, when compared to the two, 
uh, patients who underwent an adverse surgical event uh, ended up reporting more distress than patients who underwent a trauma. Um, at a year out, uh, their pain was comparable to patients who had untreated postoperative pain. As was seen in that other study, psychosocial adjustment was worse than patients with just a baseline chronic illness. And what also came about in the study is that there is an association with poor explanations given uh, when these events occurred and higher levels of disturbing memories and poor adjustment. Um, so again, that initial conversation we have with these patients is extremely important for their long-term um, well-being and recovery from these. So around the same time um, in the late 80s that we had this shift and more discussion on how we should talk to patients, uh, there was a lot of analysis on the doctors themselves and this idea of a sec second victim came about. And a second victim are healthcare providers who are involved in an, an unanticipated adverse patient event or a medical error. And they end up becoming victimized in the sense that the provider is traumatized by the event. And they end up feeling personally responsible for the patient uh, outcome. And many end up feeling that they have failed the patient or second guessing their clinical skills and knowledge base. Does anybody know who this is? I know some might. Anybody? Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Moore. So I also found this quote, uh, which I think is persistent uh, for us, and that surgeons exist in a dichotomy of a profession that demands perfection while embracing transparency and error disclosure. And uh, Ted Williams comes up a lot in talks that I found um, on air disclosure. He's considered probably to be the best um, overall hitter. He's the last one to bat over 400 in a season in Major League Baseball. And he's often compared uh, to physicians and surgeons, especially in that if we had a batting average of 400 for our cases, um, we'd be failing miserably, or as he's considered the best in his system. And that's where a lot of the stress comes from when we have errors. Uh, we want to be perfectionists, but the odds of us being perfectionists are against us. Um, studies on surgeons have found that um, after an error, uh, a little over 10% will feel like they're impaired to perform their job, and up to 2% will start avoiding certain procedures after this. Um, a study by Pinto found that there's uh, relations to post-traumatic stress disorder in some surgeons after these events. And interestingly, um, there is a, a difference between general surgeons and vascular surgeons in this aspect. Um, they theorize that a lot of our elective cases as general surgeons um, might be at better health than the chronic vascular patients, and so it's less expected if we have a worse outcome. Uh, there's a recent study on this that looked at uh, the emotional toll on surgeons, and this was presented at the New England Surgical Society in Boston. Um, the emotional toll of adverse events was very significant. Um, up to 84% uh, saw some sort of combination of anxiety, uh, guilt, sadness, shame, or anger from this. And we end up dealing with this mostly by coming to our colleagues. Again, our, I think our M&M um, lecture is very important for this. I think here we have a very uh, open culture of being able to talk to one another or our attending when things happen. Um, sometimes we will turn to friends and family, and a few of us will uh, go to therapy or counseling after these events. So are there any written ways for us to cope with this? Um, this study looked across all healthcare providers and specialties, and it turns out that there's a similar six-stage process for most uh, physicians and healthcare providers. Uh, initially, we undergo this kind of chaos and accident response as soon as it happens. Uh, we start to have intrusive reflections following that, and then starts the recovery process um, where we work to build up back our own integrity. Um, we go through the question and answering process, um, and then end up uh, attending to our emotions and then move on if we can. Uh, for surgeons specifically, they've looked at how we respond and they've noted these uh, four phases of progression. You have a kick where they've studied the actual physical response. Um, most of the time you get tachycardia, increased anxiety, and then a series of self-deprecation. Uh, after this, they describe a fall where you kind of have a black cloud around you affecting yourself as well as some others around you. And then again, starts your recovery where you have your time to discuss with others. Um, important for our specialty is the long-term impact. Um, again, there's going to be a process where we either um, survive or fall from this. And it's noted that this is thought to be um, a large aspect in surgeon burnout is how we recover from this. Um, there's a lot of studies that look into the different aspects of burnout. Um, there are some weak gender differences in um, kind of the emotional response and how they evaluate themselves and how we evaluate ourselves and 
really it's based on your social support and your program and kind of like your support from your hospital system and how you're going to recover from this. And as far as long-term care, uh, both for us and our patients, there's actually a lot out there. Um, our system here is part of the trauma network survivors. Uh, they are offered group therapy. Um, one of our attendings who's unable to be here today, Dr. Hunt, um, he staffs this and meets with the patients at these. Um, there's a medically induced trauma support services. And when I found this, I was worried it was going to be a bunch of ambulance chasers trying to get a hold of patients, but it's all free. Um, I'd encourage most of you to go there. There's a lot of support for patients and they have an entire, I think it's a 10 or 12 page PDF on resources for physicians, both on how to get support um, for themselves, for their patients, and how to establish um, support for their patients if they're in a new hospital system. Uh, there's also vitaltalk.org, which is a free system that um, gives you guidance on how to have these talks with your patients. They have modules you can go through, they have practice sessions you can have. Um, again, all that's free. And um, this is that toolkit that I mentioned on that second website. Again, they just need your email and you can download it. Um, it just lists on and on from all these um, high volume centers, uh, ways you can help yourself and your own system. So um, in conclusion over this talk, you know, this is something that will continue to happen in medicine and especially in our specialty. It's something we should not avoid. Uh, for it, um, us as physicians, the role models that we have are extremely important, um, probably more so than any standardized patient or testing we do, uh, especially for establishing good disclosure habits. And then um, care needs to be taken for the long-term recovery, both of our patients and of ourselves after these events. And this can be especially aided with um, institution-driven uh, policies and long-term follow-up. Those are my sources. And I'd just like to give a special thanks, um, obviously, to my family for being here. And like I mentioned a lot, I think our staff here is excellent at what they provide us for learning about this. Um, I think our education outside of the OR here is just as strong, if not stronger, than what we experience in the OR and especially with this. I've never felt out of place having this conversation with folks. Um, and again, to my family, they have to deal with me when I come home after stuff like this happens and um, they've been a great support group and I can't thank them enough for this. Do you want to say anything? Do you want to say anything? This is, uh, th that was one of the really good talks that I've heard here uh, <clears throat> because I would want uh, residents coming in and young residents here to know that uh, you'll find out after a while that Grand Rounds here, we usually try to find something in the discussion that will, that might be something that you'd have to answer an oral board question on to somebody like Dr. Sharp when he was on the board of surgery. This is one you won't have a question on. And yet this is one that will affect your life more than probably any of those other things will. And so that was beautifully done. For those of you that <clears throat> don't know it, we, John, we do make copies, right, of DVDs. There's a DVD copy available of this, for this for any of you that might want to have it. And I would tell you this is one you probably ought to keep and every now and then look at because it certainly is one that that I've experienced. I, I could open the floor to comment here, but we'd be going on all morning because every one of us has had uh, something like this that has affected us. Uh, which uh, last night I <clears throat> was talking to uh, a couple of families and saying that you know, one of the things we always say here is that our goal in training people is to turn out folks who are competent and confident and they're confident that they're competent. And, I, and for you and your training, I can't think of anything that would be worse than to live your life as a poorly trained surgeon because then you face this kind of thing in your life on and on and on. Uh, so I, I think that, um, that this is, is really good. Good. I have, I have a quote on, I have several quotes up there that I look at in my office every now and then. And one of them is that every good surgeon has a cemetery to which they go from time to time to reflect and meditate. And so 
fortunately or unfortunately, I'll tell you in your lifetime, you're going to have that happen to you as well. So congratulations on a great job there, Tim. Really well done. All right. A few more people have shown up that uh, we want to make mention of. Rob Hedrick, uh, former graduates and people that uh, have had a great impact on our program. Rob, uh, good to see you as always. Grant Major standing back there with the orange shirt on. Uh, a patriarch of a whole family of surgeons uh, here. Uh, Jeff Gefter, longtime colleague, radiation oncologist that uh, we've worked with and really happy to have him here. And then somebody else that I'll show you a picture of in a few minutes here. As I said, uh, this is the 29th. Um, uh, do turn those lights down, John. This is, I think, the 29th uh, Augustus McCravey lecture. Um, and uh, we're really pleased to have it. I, I always like to start. It always offends me, as many of you have heard me say, to go to a named lecture and not know anything about the person for whom it's named. And so every year we go back through this set of slides and remind you of who Augustus McCravey was. And by the way, he had no middle name. That was his name, Augustus McCravey. And he was born in 1910 uh, in this uh, combined house and uh, store down in Whitestone, Georgia, close to the railroad, where the railroad stop, uh, and grew up there, was the first person in his family to go to college, the University of Georgia, and then to graduate from medical school at MCG uh, at the age of 24. Um, he came after that to Erlanger uh, and did an internship, and so from that, his this is his picture when he graduated from college. Uh, and I, I couldn't help but uh, uh, in looking at this picture uh, this morning when I was looking back through my slides, as you'll see later, if you look at uh, one of the members of our group here uh, sitting in the audience, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree genetically, uh, I must say, uh, Dr. McCravey. So at any rate, uh, he, he did his internship here at Erlanger. And then he went to Philadelphia to Temple University, where he's one of the first people to train in neurosurgery. Neurosurgery training had just begun at that time. Uh, and uh, he became one of the first 100 board-certified neurosurgeons uh, in the world, actually. Uh, some of the nurses in the operating room would always talk about how skillful he was and said, you know, Dr. McCravey could do this operation you're struggling with with a knife, fork, and a spoon. Uh, that was after they got to know me a little better, but they were, he certainly developed great skill at a young age. He went on uh, to Fort Bragg uh, in the Army uh, where he met a young nurse named Helen Wells uh, who was from Massachusetts. And 11 months later, they got married on the eve of the Pearl Harbor attack. Um, they then, uh, after World War II came back to Chattanooga where he became, where he established the neurosurgical group because he was the first neurosurgeon here. But along the way he did a lot of other things like being the leadership of the medical society uh, on the board of trustees of Erlanger Hospital. And then they had uh, two children, uh, John McCravey who you see here on the left, uh, and, and then the taller lady in the middle there, Martha, uh, the two children, the shorter young man is, a, is, a, is her husband who is an orthopedic surgeon. So he had three physicians uh, in the family. Martha and Alan live in Tacoma, Washington where she is a prominent uh, critical care pediat pediatrician. And John, of course, is a medical oncologist here in Chattanooga. And I was pleased to be a resident when they were medical students in Memphis and have them on my service uh, as medical students, which was a real pleasure. And I always show this slide because Dr. McCravey stayed in touch with his rural roots. And this is a picture of him with a pretty good Hereford bull, even at that time a long time ago. Now, I'll briefly tell you a story here. I, I hadn't thought to tell you this before, but uh, just so you know, the he's had an impact here in Chattanooga on education and all of us. but. 
just uh, one small, uh, maybe small, and yet uh, may grow into something bigger impact he had. This shows him here talking to, uh, to Mike Greer and Bill Walker at, at one of these first graduation perf uh, uh, discussions that we had before the McCravey Lecture, by the way. But he always uh, influenced young people. And about five years ago, I was at a, at, at a, at a, at a luncheon in, in Chicago talking to a group of people about how do you handle outpatient clinics and things like that, and I started talking about, well, we've always used retired surgeons to help us uh, supervise things like our Orange Clinic. And what had happened is the first month I was here, Dr. McCravey came up to me and said, you know, and I was, I'd been in awe of him. He'd operated on my mother some 15 years before, I thought he walked on water, and, and so he came up and said, you know, uh, inter introduced himself, and I said, oh, I know who you are, and he said, uh, well, you need to do something for me. And I said, what could that be? And he said, uh, well, I put in the bylaws of our group that at age 65, you have to stop operating and seeing patients. I need you to find something for me to do, because I'm really healthy, and there's a whole lot I can still do. And so at that point, he, he became a, a faculty member and stayed that way for the rest of his life, actually. He only stopped supervising residents uh, a couple of months before his death. And so I was telling this story in this round table, and six months later, I was approached by the president of the college and the executive director of the college to head up an initiative to look at things that we could do for senior surgeons as they near retirement or are retired but you could still take advantage of the talent and experience that they'd had. And so I've been willing to do that. That has now been, just in the last few months, made a permanent part of the committee structure of the college. And there are several really significant uh, uh, initiatives that have grown out of that. But that all really came from Augustus McCravey. So just wanted you to hear that story and apologize for the length of it, but that, that, that's the, the long-term effect that this gentleman has had. Now, the McCravey Lecture, though, was not funded by him. It was funded by these two people, which is John and his mom. And Mrs. McCravey, who was a nurse, um, uh, missed, I think, the last two uh, McCravey Lectures uh, before uh, she passed on. And so she would always come, and then at the reception that night, she would get me aside and critique the talk of whoever it was about, well, you know, I didn't really understand what they were talking about, or do you think they really know what they're talking about? So she was, she remained very uh, uh, acute in her capacity to look at things uh, late in life. And this shows her with Dr. Young, or Dr. Stone. Uh, so. This is just a quote that we throw in at the end that uh, these are two people uh, that have really had an effect on, on uh, the living uh, left behind. Now, the Augustus McCravey Lectureship, we just showed, just to mention briefly, several of the people that have given it before because I know that uh, Ken Sharp would appreciate, you know, Dudrick, Rosicki, Richardson, Ashley Horrigan, John Horrigan, uh, gave the McCravey Lecture on a 36-hour notice because Scott Jones, who gave it the next year, had an acute ruptured appendicitis the day before he was supposed to come down here to be with us, and John was willing to be run in off the bench and do that, and that just goes to show you you can be well-trained here and do things uh, well long-term. Here's some more. Kirby Bland, uh, Wayne Meredith, and, that, and then, excuse me, and then uh, Brent Eastman. So this year's uh, this year's lecture is Ken Sharp, and I, I think that probably there's not a resident in this room who doesn't either know of or personally know Ken Sharp, because if we ever had anybody who really was on a faculty somewhere else who ought to be an adjunct professor here, it's Ken Sharp, because this is his fifth time to come to Chattanooga and be a lecturer here, and uh, we have really appreciated that uh, along with a lifetime with this long time friendship and the things that we've been able to get done together uh, he his his career has been marked by tremendous academic uh, scholarly activity but i think more than anything the thing he'd want people to know he is a surgeon 
Just a little bit of background, he's a native of Florida, went to the University of Florida, graduated there, but then became a full scholarship student at the Johns Hopkins University after being sought after by several other uh, medical schools as he was a Phi Beta Kappa at uh, University of Florida. He was an AOA at Hopkins, he did his residency at Hopkins, did significant uh, uh, intervals of research there, and then was recruited, recruited to the faculty at Vanderbilt and has been there ever since he started his faculty. So he's not moved around. He's been a part of a lot of things in terms of publications, but more than anything, he's been a surgeon and he's been a leader. Um, Ken Sharp has done more to advance the, the careers of young faculty here in Chattanooga than than uh, anybody other than a few people who live here with uh, our faculty daily. Um, here's just a few things that he is at present. He's the Vice Chair of Faculty Affairs at Vanderbilt, but he has also just been appointed to the Board of Regents of the American College of Surgeons, and that's the body that really runs the American College, and you'll hear him talk some about that. He is the delegate to the AMA from the Regents of the College. And you don't want to talk to him too long or he'll hit you up for a donation to the American College of Surgeons Foundation. He's, he is the leading uh, procurer of funds for that at the present time. He's on innumerable editorial boards, was on the Board of Surgery, and then has gotten teaching awards that list on two or three pages and, and then multiple name lectures. So he's, he's a member of, of almost uh, everything important that I know of in surgery, in fact he is, but if you look at the stars there, he's been president or first vice president of, of those as well, including the, the Southeastern Surgical where he was the executive secretary for 11 years and, and ran it beautifully, I must say. Uh, so, Ken Sharp's a star, he's a leader, he's a mentor, and you mentioned role modeling, uh, Tim, in your talk. Uh, this, is, uh, this is definitely uh, Ken Sharp's uh, big claim to fame. So, with that, folks, uh, I want you to welcome our friend and colleague, Ken Sharp. All right. You ready? Here's a point. You want to, you want, you want one to hold in your hand? I don't know. Let's see. Put it down there. This too. Okay, there's one there. Here, you got yours. Okay. Yeah. All right. Could I have the lights up a little bit? I, there's uh, very little more embarrassing than a resident falling asleep in the back of the auditorium than if the speaker falls asleep. So I don't want it too dark in here. I'm also going to move around, so I'm a moving target rather than stationary target. So uh, I was really thrilled when Philip called me several months ago and asked me to do this lecture. And I thought, OK, well, what am I going to talk about? And I sort of thought about, should I give a clinical talk? I've given a bunch of clinical talks here in Chattanooga over the years. I think I'll give a more forward-looking and maybe hopefully a little inspirational talk here today. Let's start here. OK. So. My question is, is there a future for surgical societies? Or are they just going to be a bunch of useless, irrelevant groups? The answer is yes. So thank you for your hospitality. <laughs> be happy to take any questions. Seeing none, I guess I have to keep going. OK, disclosures, nothing financial other than I've paid countless dollars in dues to organizations over the years, and I do support the ACS PAC and the ACS Foundation. Now, I'm told by my daughters who graduated from college not long ago that it's now considered fashionable and politically correct to issue a trigger warning. For those of you who might experience undue anxiety or stress, if you're threatened or stressed by statistics, I want you to know there were no statistical significances harmed by the preparation of this talk. Now, you've all heard the term, the phrase, it was a, it's attributed to Israeli, but it's probably not uh, attributed to him correctly. You know, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, right? You've heard that. 
So John Tarpley taught me that, there, well, actually there are four kinds of lies. Lies, damned lies, statistics, and the worst of all is the meta-analysis. You will see no statistical significance in any of this presentation today. Now, I am going to be biased. There will be overt bias in this talk for the American College of Surgeons and the Southeastern Surgical Congress, two of the institutions that are very near and dear to my heart. So yes, it will be biased and may, may be threatening. Uh, back. So here's my day at work, how I see the electronic medical record, and I think very much how the electronic medical record sees me. I am out of sync with this as I think the electronic medical record is out of sync with the practice of surgery in the current day and age. My day on the podium. Now, many of you have seen this slide. Everybody knows the post-turtle story, correct? I'm not hearing a lot of yeses out there. Okay, so the story was there was an East Texas rancher walking his fences and one day comes up and finds this on his fence. He says, well, my, I wonder how that turtle got up there. Well, lo and behold, it's a talking turtle. And the turtle says, well, sir, I'm not quite sure how I got here. I'm not sure I deserve to be here, but I surely know I had a lot of help getting up here, which is how I feel about being at the podium and talk such as this. I stand here. If I have seen the future, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. And one of the giants in my life is your boss, Philip R. Burns. R. Philip Burns. Whoop, got it backwards there, Philip. He has helped me along my career as a mentor, as a coach, as a confidant, and I think you need to know that this is not only a local or a regional phenomenon, but nationally. Dr. Burns will receive the American College of Surgeons Distinguished Service Award in October in San Francisco at Clinical Congress. A tremendous honor that's not even offered every year. So I'm a post-turtle. Okay, so first, I'm gonna congratulate the graduating chiefs in the room, Dr. Greer, Dr. Hyde, Dr. Stevens, Dr. Wilkes. Welcome, welcome to the real world of surgery now. No more duty hour restrictions. No more structured conferences and educational sessions. You are your own boss, maybe. Welcome to contracts. Obtaining and maintaining continuous certification, continuous self-education. This I cannot overemphasize. Yes, this is going to date me, but when I finished my residency, I had never touched a laparoscope. Well, I could say I still haven't, but then I'd still be doing open cholecystectomies and nystatomies, et cetera, appendectomies through big incisions. You have to keep learning. Now, whether that's a robot or a laparoscope or whatever new technology comes about over the next 10 years, you're going to have to learn it or you're going to lose your job. Welcome to the real world of continuous change and challenge. May I survey the crowd a little bit, Dr. Burns? So, of the residents in the room, how many are going into solo private practice or intend to or would like to? May I have a show of hands? Anybody going into solo private practice? How about group private practice? How about an employed physician, surgeon position? I see that's about the same number of hands, roughly. Okay, I just have to have an idea who I'm talking to. So, now we're finally starting to get around to the talk. How will surgical societies fit into your career as you age and as you leave here? What are they going to offer you? Which one should you join? Will they maintain value and relevance? I actually always thought about how do you define value of a surgical society, and I really didn't come up with a nice little cute equation about what value in medical care is, cost over quality. You know, you can have two of the three, but not all three. Why am I qualified to speak on this? Well, I'm a member of numerous surgical organizations. I'm a member of the Nashville Surgical Society, an inclusive surgical association, the Tennessee chapter of the ACS, 
inclusive organization, the Southeastern Surgical Congress and the American College of Surgeons, inclusive organizations. And I'm a member of the Southern Surgical Association, an exclusive surgical organization. Does, this, does everybody here understand the difference between an inclusive surgical organization and an exclusive one? All right, not seeing any hands. <laughs> an inclusive organization is you will be able to join, become a member if you fit our criteria. An exclusive surgical organization will have criteria that you need to fit to be a member, but because there's a fixed membership number, you may or may not be able to join that group. So they are exclusive, not inclusive. The college is inclusive. Remember, you have to be a graduate of an accredited medical education program, a surgical residency. You must practice for a year. You must obtain board certification. You must be interviewed by a group of your peers to see that you actually are practicing as a surgeon. I have headed our, I've been a member or the leader of our uh, local ACS chapter, bleh, ACS chapter interview group for over 20 years. It is not automatic that you'll become a member of the American College of Surgeons. We have people who apply whose only surgical procedure in the last year was two sigmoidoscopies. Seriously, I saw this. We have people who no longer are working as surgeons. We have people who no longer have credit, who have no credentials to practice as a surgeon. So it is not automatic. It's pretty dead gum easy, but it is not automatic. And again, I should say, I used to be the member of about 30 societies, and I didn't see that I was getting value for the cost of a good number of these, or I wasn't participating or engaged, and I'm now only about 15 organizations, which is still probably too much. I have paid as much as three to four thousand dollars a year in annual dues, not an insignificant number. What are the sources I've gone to for this talk? I've had interviews and unstructured discussions with many, many members, officers of local and regional societies, not just in the southeast, but when I've traveled to the west coast, to the northeast, to the midwest. I have formally interviewed several past officers uh, and uh, uh, current officers of the American College, the Southeastern Surgical, the Southern Surgical. I've had interviews both formal and informal with meeting professionals, people who provide CME for a living, people who provide CME as an academic expertise, and those who actually run meetings. Who come, that's, their, that's their job. What's the problem? Well, first and foremost, it's very simple. We've got too many societies. There's such an increasing fragmentation of surgery at this time that I think as you start looking at this long list of societies that want you to join, you're gonna to have to look at what's the cost versus the value. And cost here is not just dollars. Cost here is time and intellectual engagement. So time and travel away from practice, travel from your family is really important here. And you really have to gauge where am I going to spend my time? Where am I going to put my energy to become engaged? How many of you have seen this in the cemetery? None, because it's an imaginary Google image, right? <laughs> but this is, this is true. You don't want to go to your grave and be, have everybody speaking about you as, well, he was a really good surgeon, but poor family. What about his family who never got to know him or her? It's kind of pitiful at times. Uh, it was Charles de Gaulle who said, the cemeteries are filled with thousands of indispensable people. You are not. Okay, so why do surgical societies exist? As best I can tell, the first surgical society was the American Surgical, Soci American surgical Association, which was founded in 1880 by Samuel Gross in Philadelphia. And it has persisted now in its hundred and, what is this, 129th year, 139th year. Education is clearly what the purpose of most surgical societies is. And, as I said, furthering surgical science with scholarly investigation. The American College of Surgeons is probably much better known for surgical education than is the American Surgical. It was founded just over 100 years ago in 1913 by Franklin Martin a gynecologist in Chicago. 
Collegiality is clearly one of the leading reasons to be part of a surgical society. It's fun to get to know people from around the country. It's fun to get to talk to people about their problems elsewhere, what their solutions to their local and other problems are, learn new techniques. Networking is a, is a key thing here. And then I would just say that advocacy is the newest endeavor of surgical societies. PACs have been developed, political action committees, something unknown long ago. Now, this, this won't come as any surprise here, but we've had an explosion of general surgical societies, and these are just a few of the areas that we have. Obviously, orthopedics has just as many subspecialty societies as we have in general surgery, probably not as many as we do. The National Societies, American College of Surgeons, the American Surgical Association. Who knows what the ASGS is? The American Society of General Surgeons. I put this down, it's kind of a splinter group, really more than anything effective these days, but it was formed about 40 years ago when it was felt that general surgery did not have its own academy, such as an academy of orthopedic surgery, an academy of ophthalmology. General surgery is not synonymous with the American College of Surgeons. 50% of the members of the American College of Surgeons are specialists, 50%. General surgery, 49.2 or 49.8% the last I saw. So the American College of Surgeons is the house of surgery. And that causes some friction within the American College of Surgeons. The specialists see it as a general surgical society. The general surgeons say, wait a minute, we don't have a general surgical society. I just mentioned the, Ameri the American Society of General Surgery. They've not been very successful. I don't look at them as really any kind of effective national general surgical presence. We have regional and state societies. There are about 65 ACS state chapters, because some chapters are, they have multiple chapters within a state. Philadelphia, I think, has four within Philadelphia. We have a lot of regional societies, which you're all familiar with, the Southeastern Surgical Congress, the Southwestern Surgical Congress, Midwest, Northeastern, Pacific Coast, the Southern Surgical, the Western Surgical, the Central Surgical. That's not even a complete list, folks. And then the specialties. This is where the true explosion has been over the last 30 to 40 years. Oncology societies, breast societies. There are two major national breast societies. And I thought about this. Why do we need two major national breast societies? Is it left and right? Unilateral versus bilateral? I don't know. But why we need two major breast societies is just baffling to me. But we have multiple hernia societies, bariatric, colorectal, endocrine, hepatobiliary, minimally invasive. If you think of sages, as a minimally invasive surgical society, it is huge. It's grown from about 1,000 members 30 years ago to now somewhere over 8,000 members. It's huge. Robotic societies, women in surgery societies, vascular trauma, black academic surgeons, international associations, academic groups, SUS, AAS, education societies, program directors, surgical education, basic science, there are rural societies, and you know, there are truly way over a hundred that I can find, probably closer to 200 if you look far enough down the, down, the, down the list. This is just incredible. There are only about 75,000 practicing general surgeons in the country today, maybe somewhat less. That's, only, that's, that's not going to be divided among 200 organizations very well. So, what about the different cultures of societies? They're not all the same. There are a lot of differences, just in types of different cultures of surgical training programs. I, I really want to focus more on the inclusive groups than the exclusive groups. The inclusives, I'm, I'm, as I go forward, when I'm talking about a regional society, or if I say Southeastern Surgical, be careful, don't fall out of your chair there. Uh, the Southeastern is going to be kind of uh, synonymous with uh, a regional society. So if I say regional, think southeastern. If I say southeastern, think regional. Those are inclusive organizations. They want to represent surgeons as a large group rather than as a small group. The exclusive groups, the American, the Southern, the travel clubs, 
um, all have slightly different focus than that. They may be generally interested in surgery, but they'll have some little focus areas that are, say, highly academic, for example, or highly social with the travel clubs. Within surgical meetings, we're all aware of the different types of surgical meetings. The Southwestern Surgical Society Congress, uh, the sister organization of the Southeastern, meets most years at a resort. They go to Hawaii, they go to Mexico, they go to golf resorts. Um, and they often encourage a lot of family participation. When I joined the Southeastern Surgical some 30 odd years ago, we used to actually have a golf tournament or a tennis tournament during the, during the uh, meeting. It lasted five days and it just got to be more than people could do. It made a transition over the years as we found that our members wanted highly concentrated, practical, continuing medical education in a concentrated time fashion. So if you've been to the Southeastern, you know we open the sessions at 6.30 in the morning with poster grand rounds and so forth, and we run until usually 9 o'clock at night with video sessions, etc. These are the iron butts. Those who sit in their chairs, they want the maximum amount of education and information in the most compressed time they can get it. They have some will bring families, but not all that often anymore. It's a highly concentrated continuing medical education event. I thought about Iron Butts many, many years ago. Uh, Dr. Burns asked me to help run a uh, continuing medical education course from the Southeastern and the Southwestern Surgical Congresses on the continuing, let's see, what was it? Comprehensive Clinical Review in General Surgery. And it was a uh, recertification prep course. And we would do the same thing. We'd start the lectures at 7.30 in the morning. We'd run until 5.30. And we did that for two and a half days. And let me tell you, there were 55 people at 7 o'clock on the first morning, and there were 54 at the last lecture. These people wanted their education, they wanted it concentrated, and they wanted to get in and get out. The highly academic societies, such as the American Surgical and others, are, I, I have to say, they're, they're not as in... They are certainly exclusive organizations, and they just aren't as surgeon-friendly. There's not that atmosphere of, we want to give you a lot of continuing education to help you and your patient care. They're focused on advancing surgical science. I think it's just a much different culture. Not wrong, just different. So, why have I enjoyed being members, a member of numerous surgical societies? Well, here's a bunch of reasons here. One, it reflects a level of professional accomplishment. You cannot put FACS behind your name until you become a fellow. And as I said, fellowship is not hard to obtain, but is also no way automatic. You must continue your education. You must get your board certification. You must be interviewed by a committee of your peers. It is not an automatic entry. There are opportunities for presentation of scholarly work. I've enjoyed presenting my series of this, that, and the other surgical procedures over the years at the Southeastern and the Tennessee chapter and occasionally the American College. I've enjoyed this as a promotion of improvements in surgical care and education. I've, I can't tell you how many things I've incorporated into my daily practice of surgery that I've learned from some lecture or some interactive session at the college or the Southeastern or wherever that's made me better as a surgeon. There have been opportunities for leadership. It's fun to get engaged and get involved with these groups. I started with committee work, and a wise surgeon told me, okay, once, if somebody asks you to do something in a surgical society, give it to them early and give them more than they ask for. And I've taken that advice to heart, and it's worked very well for me. Friendship, mentors, mentoring. These are some of the most rewarding parts of my interaction with surgical societies today. I have people who have helped me along, I now look forward to helping my younger partners along. It's a lot of fun. It's very fulfilling. And I think that's sort of related to giving back to the profession in terms of my energy, my enthusiasm, and my engagement. I think the other thing is I've given money back. Yes, I have given a lot of money back to the American College of Surgeons as a philanthropic support for the, you know, you know we give over $2 million a year from the ACS to support scholarships in surgery. Two million dollars a year. That's an enormous number. Even, well, I guess, what was it? Uh, 
I'm going to ransom Earth for one million dollars. Okay, it's not what it used to be. All right, so let's talk a little bit locally first. What are the benefits of a regional or a local society? Well, reduce travel time and costs. Obviously, it doesn't cost me very much to travel to the Tennessee chapter of the American College of Surgeons. Um, the cost is relatively low to go to the Tennessee chapter of the American College of Surgeons. Now, when I start moving up the chain a little bit, well, let's think about the Southeastern Surgical. Well, if the Southeastern Surgical is held in Chattanooga like we had it hmm, five years ago and eight years ago, uh, here, well, driving down from Nashville was not a big deal, very inexpensive. Hotel rooms here aren't terribly expensive. But nowadays, what if that, what if that Southeastern Surgical Congress meeting is in Jacksonville, as we had it three years ago? Well, driving to Jacksonville is going to be an extra day out of my work schedule, an extra day out of my time with my family. And so the cost, well, now I'm going to fly. That's going to cost more than driving. So a local or a regional society may or may not have an advantage in terms of travel time and cost. Now, collegiality, social interactions, clearly these are good. I love the Tennessee chapter meeting. I love the Southeastern Surgical Congress meeting. They have a lot of collegiality. I'll come to some other points about this in a bit, but just remember, it's much easier to get involved with a speaker when there are 100 people in the audience rather than at the clinical congress where there's an audience of a thousand listening to two speakers, you can't get much personal interaction there. The regional and the local societies frequently use pretty nice venues. You know, for many years, the Tennessee chapter met at our state parks, Fall Creek Falls, Paris Landing, Pickwick, uh, et cetera. Inexpensive, depending on which part of the state you lived in, they may or may not be easy to get to. They have come a bit decrepit, so we've kind of moved away from those, but we often used very nice venues. As you may or may not know, the Tennessee chapter will be here at the Weston in about six weeks. Nice venue. Chattanooga is a nice town to visit. Now, I suppose I should say, I'm, I'm not sure it's nicer than Nashville. I've got to be a little bit of a homie here. Okay. All right. So what are, what are some of the problems that are facing our surgical societies? Well, clearly, the increasing fragmentation of general surgery. That, that, I just... I just have to kind of leave it at that. The number of subspecialties that are developing is just enormous. I, I am still waiting to see a society for the left inguinal hernia uh, surgeons of, the, of America. Membership maintenance. When you have fragmentation, well, you don't have as many people in the pool to join all these organizations. And nobody can afford to be a member of 50 groups. You can't afford it. You can't get engaged with them. You've got to pick your spots and go where you're going to get your bang for the buck. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, rising cost of meeting, dues are going up, travel costs. Actually, travel costs, if you index for inflation, are not going up. Airfares today are somewhere between 20 and 40 percent lower than they were compared to 25 years ago indexed for inflation. Relevance to the practicing or the academic surgeon, okay? There are different societies for different focus. And changing generational culture. Do the Gen X surgeons and the millennial surgeons want the same thing I do out of a surgical society? Do they learn the same way that I've learned over the years? When I was a resident, it was considered very high tech to go to the library, search the paper index medicus, find a citation, go to the bound volume, and the high-tech part became, I went and used a Xerox machine to make a copy of that paper that I could then show to the attending or show to the other residents. Well, my residents today stick their hand in their pocket when they want to learn something. It's incredible what these little pocket computers can do. The other thing I like doing about, with whenever I was a resident or a student, when I went to the library, it was a great place to take a nap. And so our residents don't even know where our, our library is because they can take a nap anywhere. And then they can use this to find anything they really want to find. So there's clearly a difference in learning style. I don't know whether there's any difference in what people want out of surgical societies. I think younger surgeons still want engagement. They still want collegiality. They still want networking. 
the things that are best obtained face to face. Better than Skype, better than FaceTime. Membership maintenance. Most regional societies are struggling to maintain membership numbers. And if you don't maintain membership numbers, your revenues go down and your engagement goes down. Many are losing members. At any time, this is, this is you probably have never heard, five to 10% of our ACS chapters have no meetings, no leadership, or serious financial troubles, or seriously declining attendance. Five to 10% of our ACS chapters. The Southeastern Surgical, again, I'll use that as an example. 40 years ago, we had over 3,000 members. We had cardiac surgeons, we had urologists, otolaryngologists. Now we have less than 1,000, or approximately 1,000. We can't maintain that same number and engage them as a general surgical society. Okay, I've alluded to this several times, rising costs of meeting, dues, travel. This is going to work against all societies of all types, medical, surgical, whatever. Practice costs are up. Reimbursements are decreasing. There's a, there's a news flash for you. Cost exceeding inflation to provide the basics of a surgical meeting. All right, here we go. I'm dating myself again. I remember when 35 millimeter slides were high tech. They were state of the art. And it was even more impressive if you had what, do, what we call dual projection. You had two carousels going at once. That was really fancy. Well, nowadays, we need multiple computers. I think there's probably, I wonder how many computers are back in John's uh, projection room back there. We need multiple projectors. We need IT. We have an IT person to show slides for us. No wonder costs are going up. The venue costs for food and amenities are just rising astronomically. Um, last year, or no, earlier this year, February in Charlotte, the Southeastern Surgical Met, and what do you think we paid for a, a gallon of coffee? Any guesses? 20 bucks, 40 bucks? 110. $110 for a gallon of coffee. Okay, and if we drank it all, that was great. If we didn't drink it all, we still paid for the gallon. Now, the travel cost, as I previously said, actually, as you index for inflation, is not going up. That's, that's, the, that's the good news here. But it's still time. It's still time. The cost of time is such a serious issue these days. What about the societies and their relevance to the surgeon? Well, why does an academic surgeon want to go to a local or regional meeting? And I'll, I'll address this in a little bit. But why does Ken Sharp, I'm an academic surgeon, I've had a private practice at Vanderbilt for 35 years now, but I'm an academic surgeon, I'm an employed surgeon. Why do I want to go to a local meeting? And we'll talk about that. And why would a private practice surgeon go to the American Surgical and hear the latest cutting edge basic science research I mean, I'm serious, I don't really want to go anymore in here about mitochondrial DNA. I just, you know, it's not helping me in my daily practice of surgery. So surgeons do want to pick and choose. There's no question, if you don't do trauma, why do you want to go to a trauma meeting? Well, now trauma has now taken over and believes that it is the home of emergency surgery. I disagree with that in many ways, but I think as a practice style, it, it has some, it has some uh, advantages. So trauma now is now, actually I'm on the program committee at the American College of Surgeons, and so whenever we're reviewing all our possible poster and pre, uh, uh, podium presentations, we have a whole group of GI folks that present ideas for topics on diverticulitis, perforated ulcers, emergency surgical topics. And then further down the list, we've got the acute care, so the trauma surgeons who are submitting the same topics that they believe that it's in their house, it's their wheelhouse. Now, that was, that was an aside between trauma and general surgery. Sorry about that. Um, if you have a heavy concentration of endocrine surgery, breast surgery, yeah, you really want to go to those meetings. You want to go to the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons. You want to go to one of the breast society meetings. I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm not here to say that specialty societies are intrinsically or inherently evil or non-competitive or non-collegial. But what about the broad-paced practicing general surgeon? The surgeon who does breast, colorectal, hernia, uh, a smattering of vascular or even thoracic. 
those are still where our, our regional meetings, i.e. Southeastern, thrive. We cover the broad field of general surgery in those meetings. We try to have topics that cross all the areas of general surgery. This is really key, I think, for regional societies. I'm really not sure that a uh, Tennessee chapter of the American Hernia Society is going to really do very well. Where are we going with our local and regional societies? I think the future is still pretty good for these, for these groups because of the broad-based nature of their general surgical offerings. And so you may be in private practice with a heavy focus in colorectal, but you're still taking call for trauma or acute care surgery. So you really want to remember, what are the inherent difficulties with doing a red-hot gallbladder? How do you deal with a perforated ulcer? I think that you're still offering bang for the buck. So I really feel like the American College, but the regionals will offer, offer these sort of uh, topics for general surgeons. I think increasingly advocacy is going to become important. How many of you in the audience realize that we're developing a PAC in the Tennessee State Chapter? Anybody? A few people, okay. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big deal. We are still working through all of the hassles of uh, getting the, the legal issues done, but we're going to have a PAC that we can use to influence state legislation that influences the practice of medicine and the practice of surgery. And I think that's going to be important because it will be totally different than what the ACS PAC will do. I think here's where now we start to talk about academic surgeons and local and regional societies. I've always called the Southeastern Surgical a starter society when I talk to my young faculty. Okay, you're a young faculty member, you've been in place for two, three, four years. You don't have a series of 150 uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, myomectomies for fibroids. You don't have large clinical series that you can impress the, the nation with, but you have small series of focused issues that you can present, and it's where you learn to collect material, to present material, to respond to questions about things that you've done and have some, developed some expertise in. I think this is a critical role for our regional surgical societies. I still firmly believe that the locals and the regionals will be an optimal venue for private practicing surgeons to get CME, to learn new surgical techniques, meet potential referring surgeons, and meet surgeons to consult for problem cases. Because if you have that mix of the academics who are focused on left inguinal hernias and the practicing surgeon, one of the great things about the Southeastern Surgical is there is never any hesitation for audience members to go up and ask Dr. Burns after he gives a talk on, let's say, image-guided breast biopsy. There is no hesitation by our audience to go grab him in the hall or in the coffee area and you know, get more detail. How do I do this? How do I manage this kind of problem? How do I manage this complication? The interaction, the interaction between professionals at Southeastern Surgical is really without uh, peril. There's nobody else that does it any better. Smaller venues, and I just said, smaller audience equals vastly improved interaction between speakers, experts, and attendees. And I think this is one of the critical values of the Southeastern Surgical. Where are we going? Okay, what about future success? Cost containment will be key. Well, how can we contain cost? Well, fewer lunches, fewer breakfasts, things like that doesn't really reduce the cost for the attendee. It just shifts the cost from a registration fee to a, you know, where you're going to get breakfast before the session starts. But we've got to work hard to keep registration fees as affordable as we can. We've got to show value. What am I taking home from this meeting? A skill? Some new knowledge that I can just change by, I can change practice by changing my order sets on my preoperative patients? Some relaxation time. A new friend, a new colleague, somebody you learn something from, somebody who becomes a reference or a resource for you. Will I be taught in these meetings to, to learn and incorporate new skills and new techniques? Now, these are difficult. Even the, even the American College of Surgeons really struggles with trying to pe teach people hands-on skills. That's really difficult, but we've given it a strong, I'm going to mention Philip again. The first surgical society in America to teach hands-on, image-guided breast biopsy was the Southeastern Surgical Congress. 
the Southeastern Surgical Congress had the first postgraduate course, hands-on image-guided breast biopsy. We were ahead of the curve. And again, I mentioned this again, we have to accommodate newer generations and their learning styles. I am totally the wrong speaker to tell you how to do this. I'm not sure what I would say to younger surgeons, what's your best way to learn? You're gonna to have to tell me. Is it taking home video? Is it access to internet available teaching? More social media? How can distance learning, if you can't travel to a meeting, how do you interact with a meeting that's going on? I've really never seen a way that that works very well. You know, web broadcasting of live surgical sessions at the American College of Surgeons have really gone nowhere over the years. So I'm not sure where we're going with some of this. Uh, my strong bias is, is that distance learning doesn't work as well. The interaction goes to zero. I can watch an interactive session going on online of an American College of Surgeons podium presentation, but then I can't ask questions very well. I can't walk up to the speaker and really kind of look them in the eye and say, does this really work? You know, I've tried that, it doesn't work. I think we lose a lot of that with distance learning. So, come back to the American College, another group that's near and dear to my heart. Why are my dues so high? Why are they going up? Well, the first thing I would say is, compared to internal medicine, pediatrics, pathology, emergency medicine, our dues are consistently lower than any of the other major medical associations. They also don't do as much as you think you do. Less than 25% of the operational costs of running the American College of Surgeons is provided by dues. Less than 25%. We've also had declining industrial support. How many of you have been to the college meeting in the last three years and also were there 10 years ago? What is the size of the exhibit hall doing? It is, we used to have about two acres, sometimes three or four acres of exhibit space filled with industry. I remember when there were hospital beds and OR lights and things like that that the surgeons were being recruited for because they could actually make decisions at their local hospital. I want this OR bed. I want that OR light. I want this laser. How many of you can pick your own stapler? Anybody? Who's an Ethicon, who's a COVID, who's a, I guess it's not COVID, what is it now, uh, Medtronic. How many of you can make the choice between those two at your hospital? Nobody. So industry has figured that out. So surgeons are no longer drivers of purchasing. So we are losing out. And so now, we, and actually our, our industry exhibit revenues are down by well over 50%. They used to provide several million dollars a year to underwrite the cost of the Clinical Congress. It's one of the reasons we've had to start charging attendance fees for clinical congress in addition to your dues. You know, I probably shouldn't emphasize this for the young people, but it used to be you attended clinical congress for free if you paid your dues. Here's a big one, and I'm going to talk more about advocacy at the very end of the talk. Increasing cost for advocacy. How many of you have been to the that beautiful 20F Street building in D.C. that the American College built 10, 12 years ago? Handful, okay. PAC donations, how do our PAC donations fold into support of that building? There are over 20 full-time employees, two full-time physicians who staff that office in DC. How are, how are they paid? Dues. PAC donations must go in directly to campaigns. They may not go to support anything else. I'll talk about this in a little bit more depth in a bit. The college is steadily increasing revenue generation, and this in and of itself is controversial. ATLS, CSAP, bring in a lot of money to the college, but then we turn around and, and, the, and our fellows complain about the costs of those products. All of the quality improvement programs now, you know, we started with NISQIP, we've now got TQIP, uh, children's surgery verification, we've got uh, vascular coming, uh, bariatric is in place, all of those programs raise revenue for the college, but the costs of those to the programs and to the hospitals are really a problem right now. People don't want to pay for four different quality improvement programs within their, within their, within their hospital. 
Okay. Now we get a little bit more high and mighty. Franklin Martin, gynecologist, helped found the American College of Surgeons in Chicago in 1913. How many of you have been to the Murphy Auditorium? Pretty cool little place. That's where the original meetings were held. And then, this is kind of, you've got a little interesting trivia here coming up. Okay, so the seal of the American College of Surgeons, which I have displayed here. Whoops, that's the wrong one. Let's see here. There we go. There we go, technically challenged. So, the seal was developed by a Chicago pub publisher named Paul Volland, V-O-L-L-A, and D-O-C-M. And there was a competition to develop a seal for the American College of Surgeons. And so this publisher d developed this. This is a healer. This is a Native American healer. We found it in 1913. And he actually put, the college didn't do this. Paul Volland made our motto. I think that's a little bit interesting. What, you know, a surgeon didn't develop this. What does it stand for? I'm, I, I am not going to try to say this. I never took Latin, so I'm not going to pronounce this. But that is our motto, to serve all with skill and fidelity. If you look at our website, the banner right now reads, inspiring quality, highest standards, better outcomes. I think here's where we're going to start to see a shift in the role of the American College of Surgeons in today's surgery and surgery practice. Until 2004, the college focused on improving the care of the surgical patient. That was really its true mission. Now, many of you may not know, JCAHO was born out of efforts by the college to standardize hospital operations for the betterment of surgical care so that hospitals had to meet certain standards to be certified. The quality programs now, the whole idea is we're trying to improve surgical care by reducing complications uh, and improving outcomes. Now to me, one of the things that really gets me down is I think that when we look at so many of these quality improvement programs, we look at things which are quality metrics. Now what's one of the most common quality metrics out there? Length of stay. Can somebody tell me why length of stay is a quality metric? God, I'm not getting any help here. Qu length of stay is an economic metric. It's a metric that helps hospital administrators. It's a metric that helps insurance companies. Does it give you a better reimbursement, Dr. Giles, if you get your paper out patient out of the hospital a day earlier than Dr. Dart? Is the patient more satisfied? Anyway, so I think we have a lot of conflicting metrics here. So I, I do have a lot of problems with some of our quality today. Um, sidebar, education of the surgeon. Obviously, CME, continuing medical education, was one of the key initial uh, focuses of the American College of Surgeons. It, we helped found the American Board of Surgery. And I can't just, I can't de-emphasize the amount of continuing medical education across incredible numbers of fields that the ACS provides. What happened in 2004? Anybody know that? I do, because I have a check from then. We formed a PAC. We formed a PAC. We formed a political action committee. Up until that time, I really think that the ACS was seen as an egalitarian society, elitist society. We were too important and too noble to get our hands into the dirty area of politics. But I think it became widely understood that we needed to get involved with representation of surgeons and surgical patients, or else people who had no idea about the practice of surgery, i.e. politicians, insurance company, hospital administrators, were going to drive surgical care. Obviously, all kinds of others, but I'm in a surgical audience. This was a radical, a radical departure from previous ACS policy. I can't tell you how much gnashing of teeth occurred with uh, the old gray hairs who were purists and the young Turks who said, we need representation. We need representation in DC. We need people who are gonna fight for legislation and regulation that affects our daily practice. And increasingly now, I would say over the past five years, increasingly affects our 
reimbursement, our remuneration. There is no insurance company out there today that is interested in your financial security. There is no insurance company out there today that gives up about your $200,000 medical school debt. There's no insurance company out there that gives a damn about any of that stuff. So who's going to do it? Well, okay, I'm a member of the American Society of Left Angle Hernia Surgeons. They're going to represent my, me and the other nine members. We're going to go to Congress and argue for higher remuneration. That isn't going to work, folks. Who's going to be able to do this? What's the biggest surgical society in the country? Three letters. Starts with A. You betcha. 80,000 members. By the way, this year we're going to initiate over 2,000 new members to the ACS as fellows. The largest induction class probably ever. People are becoming cognizant of the value of ACS and of the efforts that it makes in such things as a PAC. We are now an advocacy organization. We are now a representative organization. We are here to represent surgeon, surgical finances, surgical uh, future. What's the, I mean, I honestly believe that if we don't get involved, we're going to become the worst of the widgets in the world. You know, Dr. Sharp, you're going to go over to uh, Cookville General and you're going to do hernias on Tuesday. And on Thursday, you're going to go to Smithville and do gallbladders. And on Friday, you're going to Murfreesboro to do colonoscopy. That's the commoditization of general surgery. And it's going to happen if insurance companies and administrators continue the <coughs> excuse me, trajectory that we're on now. We are going to be widgets. I'm already a widget, but we are going to be worse widgets as we go forth. Okay, so the PAC, I really think the, the, the future is really bright here. A little bit of word about the PAC. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with, how many donate to the PAC? All right, good, good, I like that. I'd like it better if it was the foundation, but I'm okay with that. Uh, all the dollars that you give to the PAC, and remember it has to come from a personal check, cannot come from a practice. It has to come from a personal check, personal donation, goes to campaigns. PAC cannot distribute that money to staff for our lobbyists, for the physician, for the two surgeons that work for us in analyzing legislation and regulation. And so this is where your dues. So people, you, you don't think of your dues supporting the PAC if you understand what a PAC does, but they do. That's where F Street Building Mortgage is being paid. That's where the salaries of those 20 staffers of the PAC come from. And this is a critical new development that we've had in the ACS. I picked a, a kind of an arbitrary time frame here uh, that I just saw in one of the publications a few months ago, that between January of 2017 and April of 2018, we dispersed $541,000. 59% went to Republicans, 41% went to Democrats. We do not support parties. We give nothing to the Republican Party, nothing to the Democratic Party. That's actually illegal but we give to campaigns. We don't give to somebody because they're a Republican or because they're a Democrat. We do it because they have stances, advocacy, interest, and in, in alignment with what we in the ACS think is good for surgeons and surgical patients. The most recent number I saw, we were almost 50-50 between Republicans and Democrats as who we gave money to. And you cannot tie your PAC money to a specific cause or a specific person. I cannot write a check to the PAC and say, I want uh, this money to go to uh, Senator Alexander's campaign. And uh, again, illegal. We cannot support people. We can support causes. We only disperse money to House and Senate races. We do nothing to support presidential races. I actually didn't know that until a couple of years ago. So I've given to the PAC for, let's see, what is it now, 15 consecutive years except for one. I could not give money when it was the Donald versus the Hillary. I just could not stomach that race. I didn't give any money that year, but every other year I have. Now, if I had been smarter, I would have known that I wasn't supporting either one of them, but I wasn't. We cannot give to state or local races. Therefore, formation of a Tennessee PAC. You know, we have what is it, like five surgeons in the Tennessee House and uh, the Tennessee Senate 
Dr. Sabi Kumar is a friend of mine from Springfield, Tennessee, is one of our representatives who speaks very strongly for things that are important to doctors and surgeons. And we can, with a PAC, we can help support him. Now, support is what this support, <laughs> support's a funny word here. Uh, are we supporting him or are we influencing him? Are we buying influence? Well, we can argue over that. But that's the, that is the currency of getting into a representative's or a senator's office. No donation, you don't get any entry, you don't get any voice. Like it or not, that's the real world. Gotta love politics. Okay. So I think we're looking at what can we do from the ACS to improve the lives of surgeons. And let me, let me just sound crass, commercial, and uh, oh, insensitive. Oh, the hell with the patients. Why do I want to get better as a surgeon? I'm trying to keep my office open, and Medicare reimbursements only went up 2% between 2002 and 2018, whereas practice expenses went up by somewhere between 40% and 50%. And nobody gives a damn. Nobody. The insurance companies don't care. Hospitals don't care. But the ACS does. So how are we going to do? Let's, again, let's go crassly commercial. How can we help influence surgical reimbursements? This is a struggle. This is a struggle. How can we keep the House from in, in making new mandates in regulation that affect our practices? I mean, we're all so grateful for the institution of the electronic medical record and the regulations and reimbursement issues that strongly favored adoption of electronic medical records. Has it been an advancement in your practice? Anybody in this room? Has the EMR helped your practice? No, I'm not raising my hand. Nobody in, nobody in the room? There are no tech gurus back there who say, yeah, well, I use this really well. It's really fun. Good God. Okay. Are solo or group practices doomed? It's a dying breed. Somewhere around 70 to 75 percent of surgeons today are employed. That used to, in about 10 years ago, that figure was about 25 to 30 percent. So are all surgeons going to be employed by large groups, by hospitals, insurance companies? Don't tell me Kaiser Permanente is not an insurance company. What about hedge funds and venture capitalists? You are, are you aware that there are small practices in neurosurgery, plastic surgery, some of the higher reimbursing that are being bought by hedge funds, by venture capitalists? Now that tells me something really important. Hedge funds don't go out there except to make money. Venture capitalists are not in it for altruism. Venture capitalists are there to increase their return on their money. So if they buy a group of plastic surgeons, there's got to be money there that's not currently being generated. That, that alone tells you there's something real out there that's happening. And it's going to get worse. So let's form a union, the ACS union. Now I thought, you know, grew up watching uh, 20 Mule Team Borax, the teams, the idea of a teamster, I always thought, God, be a teamster, that sounds kind of fun driving 20 mules and carrying a train load of bar, uh, borax behind me. But you know, it doesn't work, does it? Why can't we form a union? Why can't the ACS form a union? It's illegal. It's illegal. You know, Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. By the way, some of this comes straight from David Hoyt's uh, article or uh, column in the bulletin, May of this year. Not hard to find. Just search out the bulletin and look at David's column for May of 2019. The Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 was developed to keep antitrust in trust. We had too many large, you know, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, uh, who were raping the public with their monopolies in oil, in railroads, in steel, okay? But it kind of then bounced back the other way. Em employees could organize, but the Sherman Antitrust Act prevented groups of individuals from organizing into unions. So I can't just, oh, let's say I'm gonna pick the people on this side of the audience and you're gonna be at the Ken Sharp Surgical Union. That's illegal for me to do. The Federal Antitrust Act says I can't do that. Now, how many of you are aware that in New York State, uh, residents are organized? They are as a union of residents in New York. They're organized under 
the Service Employees International Union, whatever, CIU, whatever it's pronounced. We can't do that. There was a special state legislation developed to allow that. So in somewhere around 1940, there was a Supreme Court uh, finding that states could write regulation and law to protect groups who wanted to organize on a state level. And because federal, leg federal legislation says that federal antitrust issues are inviolate, states are allowed to develop legislation that may encourage groups of physicians, surgeons to organize, to group together. So this is now we're sort of referring to this as joint contracting legislation. So the Division of Advocacy and Health Policy in DC has, has looked at this very carefully. So we can look towards organizing as groups of surgeons if we get state legislation that allows us to avoid federal antitrust legislation. This gets into the political and legislative weeds. I'm not, this, I could really put a bunch of you to sleep with this. But just uh, eight weeks ago, maybe, uh, Pat Bailey, who is one of the two physicians that represents us in the DC office, and David Hoyt met with the FTC, had a day long meeting uh, to explore this. And they learned about, well, we need to develop state level legislation if we want to organize as surgeons to avoid federal antitrust law. Now, I can't get into the weeds. I don't know that they even know where the weeds are yet. How would we do this? What would be the structures? Uh, will surgeons take risk? Probably so. So this is an exciting and I think absolutely essential role for the ACS as we go forward. So those of you who want to be Teamsters, like me, sorry, not going to happen. But we're going to be able to develop things to help protect your practice. So why join? Personal, personal fulfillment, professional, improving your knowledge, improving the care of your patients. So I'm going to take back off my greedy, you know, non-caring hat. I've learned a lot in terms of better care of my patients through all of these meetings and groups I've joined. Um, people have come to respect me for maybe the right or wrong reasons. And I think that the other reason you want to join is for the profession, for the profession of surgery. I think we're going to be terribly devalued if we let things keep on going as they're going. We will truly become widgets. We will become widgets. So we need advocacy for the surgeon, not the surgeon. Well, again, getting, going back a little bipolar on this. Not for the patient. We do that. There is not a person in this room who wants to go out and say, oh, I'm going to give some kind of average care to my patient. I'm going to do this kind of average operation. Okay? We already are intensely inculcated with those values. Now we need to work for helping each other as surgeons. Otherwise, our careers in the future can be very unsatisfying. So I think this is incredibly important for the future of surgery, and surgery is a discipline. So, is there a future for surgical societies? Large capital letters bolded. Yes. I think it's going to be even more important as our healthcare system, and I put healthcare system in quotes because we don't have a system, but it's changing and it's going to keep changing. We're going to have challenges that change every year. If we don't, I don't, I'm sorry, but each individual surgeon is not going to be influencing this at a national or even a local level. We need groups, we need a loud voice. So, final thoughts. This is to the residents that are finishing, the residents that are coming along, the residents that are sitting in their chair thinking, what does this mean for me? I don't even know how to do a hernia repair. Uh, go out and be the best surgeon you can be. As I said, I don't believe there's a person in this audience who says, I'm going to go out and I'm going to be an average surgeon. I'm going to be, okay. <laughs> what's that insurance going? I'm just okay. Is that AT&T, I think? Was that AT&T? Yeah. All right. I'm going to be just okay. I don't know anybody like that. If I did, I certainly wouldn't associate with them. Your patients desperately need your skills. And there's nobody who's going to replace you. We can argue over the role of nurse practitioners, DNPs, physician assistants, advanced practice. Uh, we're not going to have nurses doing trauma care. 
We're not going to have nurses doing hernia repairs in my lifetime. So, join. Join. Be a part of something bigger than yourself. Join the societies that I've talked about. The American College of Surgeons, there's, there's just no negotiation, guys. Girls, you got to do this. You have to be an American College of Surgeons fellow. Join the Southeastern, okay? Maybe that's not as important. If you live in the Southeast, it's pretty important. Be active in your local chapters, in your local societies. They are going to provide a lot of satisfaction and a lot of improvement in your career. So finally, join because your fellow surgeons need you, your wisdom, your skills, and you need your fellow surgeons. They're going to support you. They understand what you're doing. They understand the stresses you're going through. And they're going to provide representation with you as a larger group. So this is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. This is something we all need to do if we want to maintain the sanctity and the spirit of our, of our discipline. So thank you. I hope you've been positively influenced this way. Uh, there are a lot of people around you who have been tremendous influences in your career and my career. And I think that uh, any of them who have been around for a while are willing to talk to you about this. So I'll end it there and just say let's talk. Thank you. So I think the next question is, tell me what you really think, Dr. Sharp. We can turn the lights up now. Ken, thank you for that. Uh, I think what we'll do in the interest of time is probably uh, break for about 15 minutes and, and then uh, start again. Ken will be available to talk to you uh, personally. And uh, again, we thank you for that uh, great talk. Uh, very stimulating, I hope, to everybody here because we're on the same page. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Oh, man. Well, oh, it was a little passion. Yeah, it's a little good. passion. That's good. Yeah. Uh, that was excellent. Heath, thank you. I think the thing I got out of that most is um, I can't tell you how many friends I have that I went to medical school with who are not members of the ACS who every time they ask me why, why do I mean, I'm in private practice mm -hmm. colorectal what's the benefit and I can never articulate it but
I always never have the right connector. Well, I, I've spent about four hours out of the past two days just working on technical issues. about the uh, signal strength. Yeah. <laughs>
when we, when we run the HDMI from here to back there, we have a, a little device that's a mm -hmm. booster, mm -hmm. and it's not running through HDMI cable, it's running through Cat5 Ethernet cable. Mm -hmm. So we have a translator on one end and a translator on the other end. <laughs> And you shove yeah. a whole bunch of power through it. <laughs> yeah. You can go long distances. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's. Yeah, does that make sense? It's something that kind of. Yeah. I mean, even electricity thing, you know, still acts you know, more like more physical things sometimes. Yeah. As far as Fluorescence interfere with the signal. Oh, uh, yeah, like, They're yeah. They're putting out 60 cycles, so you have to have a shield of cables and all that kind of stuff. Man, a lot of things you don't think about no. just as an <laughs> average Joe, not, you know, yeah. thinking about what goes into all of this. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we've had to move cables. They've run them over the ballast and the ceiling and all the yeah. lights. I think it's because it's uh, it's 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 picking up. Yeah. That's crazy. Ready to go, buddy? Yes, sir. This is still on the internet. Yeah, I know. That's it. It is. Oh, shoot. There we go. Then we go off to the normal. Oh, yeah. Well, that's Shaking all right. up the natural it's order all right. a little bit. It's all right. That usually happens on these guys. We're good. Hey, Bob. See if you get people back in.
we can get everybody to find a seat, we're going to try to get started. We know the golfers are going to want to get out and get started golfing. So for us to finish up, we're going to need to get started again. During the break, we uh, saw some additional people come in. I mentioned uh, Grant Major, um, and then I, I failed to mention Ralston. I didn't see him until after I stopped talking, but uh, Ralston Major, this may this is uh, may date me somewhat, but I think I could possibly be the only chairman in, in history who was the chairman when he was born during a residency and then he graduated while you're still the chair. And in our next person, he was even born after that time and is still in the chair because when his dad was a resident. So anyway, Steve Greer uh, is going to give the next talk. But before I do that, if they step, well, they stepped out of the room, please all of you uh, recognize our staff that are here uh, Cindy Rudolph, Maggie Hamblin, I know I've seen them. They're here, Kim Crawford, uh, and Pat Lewis, uh, at, at least, uh, are around. And without them, sure make it very difficult to pull this off the way we, we do. So Steve's going to go next. He is, um, as I said, his dad, long-time faculty and resident here. What, what's our problem uh, here now? Don't tell me we're going to have to. Uh, we had a picture, now we don't. Call yeah, out. Yeah. Uh, I've got a backup plan. Okay. Well, a good surgeon should always have that's a backup right. plan. Um, that's for sure. Um, but anyway, Steve is uh, going to, is finishing and going to stay here on our faculty as a general surgeon. Uh, and we look forward to that. He's. Uh, been an outstanding resident, uh, had a lot of great presentations from this podium. We're going to do another one today. Uh, it will also be a privilege to, for you, I'm sure, to be a co-fellow, a co-faculty member with your dad. Uh, not very many places have had, had that advantage over time. So congratulations on that, and we look forward to your talk, Steve. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Burns. Uh, thank you to everyone here for all you've done for me and uh, for all the people who have I've drug into the technical aspects of getting this talk together, they are innumerable. Um, anyway, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my topic today is going to be about hernia mesh, it's something that we hear from our patients a lot about recently in, in the media. Uh, I have no disclosures, and we'll start. with The video. thousands of people every day, it isn't a story that corporate media would ever tell you. In fact, they can't tell you because they're corporate advertisers, the people who make these products. Well, they won't allow them to do investigative exposés about how dangerous surgical mesh really is. The advertising dollars are just too big. Surgical mesh reinforcement use has become routine for hernia repair and a handful of other surgical procedures that are performed every day all over America. What most patients don't realize is that the mesh is made up of polypropylene and has the ability to oxidize and degrade directly into human tissue and throughout the entire body. The first signs of this manifestation begins with things like chronic fatigue syndrome or extreme consistent rashes and the, the diffuse joint pain throughout the entire body. In addition to those issues with polypropylene that we've seen so often, the added problem is the use of experimental coatings that have been used mostly as a sales gimmick by manufacturers to sell doctors a product that has potential to degrade and migrate throughout every organ in the body. The pitch that the companies use is that the mesh is quick and it's fast and anybody can do it even without special doctor training. The sales gimmick coatings have been associated with increased infections, bowel perforations, fluid buildup within the wound, and overall failure of the device which necessitates a second, third, and sometimes a fourth surgery to correct the problem. The most interesting part of this story though is that mesh isn't even necessary to, to, to do the type of tissue repair that takes place with a procedure like hernia repair. 
For decades, doctors who are specifically trained for natural tissue repair have successfully made hernia repairs and other human body tissue repairs with natural body tissue, with no use of anything called mesh. The obvious advantage to that is that there's no introduction of a foreign body into the procedure that has the ability to degrade and migrate throughout the body, triggering autoimmune reactions, which is what we see with the coated mesh gimmick that's being sold to any and every doctor who wants to perform a procedure without any kind of special training. Here's the real stinger, though. None of these procedures have been studied before they received approval by the FDA. In fact, the only reason that these products are on the market is because of a fast-track 510K procedure that the FDA permits for these types of surgical devices. Unlike what most people believe, there is no FDA testing with in-house on these experimental meshes before they're placed on the market. But everybody believes that's the case, that the FDA is looking over the manufacturer's shoulder. That just is not how it works. As we've seen so many times again and again, it's always about quick profits and big risks where it comes to so many medical devices and pharmaceuticals that have been placed on the market where patients actually become guinea pigs. And in this particular story, guinea pigs are not doing well at all. More on that later. Uh, so going over our talk, um, we're, we're going to try, this is going to really be more of an overview. We're just going to touch on a lot of things briefly. This is a hard topic to really get into the nitty gritty, different kinds of hernia repairs, different kinds of hernia. There's a lot of apples and oranges, but what I'm trying to do is do the best of, of kind of covering this topic as again, as we see so many times. So to start off with some history, uh, is the obligatory or Greek origin, hernios meaning to butter sprout. And the first uh, mentions we have of hernias really start uh, and, and pretty pretty far back. Uh, the Ebers Papyrus, which is dated around 1550 BC, uh, is one of the first descriptions of hernia, not the first. And they describe it as a swelling of the abdomen above the umbilicus, which comes forth when they cough. So uh, pretty, pretty accurate. Uh, here is the description of how to, to treat it. Uh, the swelling covering the abdomen. The illness of child treat. It is the heat of his bladder in front of his belly, which creates it. Falling to the ground, it returns likewise. You should heat it to imprison in his belly. You treat it like the Sahemin treatment. Uh, and what that uh, Sahemin treatment is has been lost to history, so we don't exactly know what they did, but it involved heat of some sort. Uh, and this picture here on the right uh, is actually from an, uh, a hieroglyph, uh, a carving from ancient Egypt, and you can see the, the workers uh, suffering from uh, protruding uh, ventral hernias. So uh, this was a known entity then. Going back even a little further in 1700 B.C., uh, Hammurabi, famous for his big... Uh, code, big, big carve uh, block of, of laws, uh, describes hernias as well, and prescribed treating these with bandages to keep them covered. And you'll see this is something that has really persisted throughout history. Uh, hernia trusses ways of trying to keep the hernias reduced. Uh, this is a medieval example uh, of a truss, and we actually still see these today sometimes. Um, this one does not appear as supportive. Uh, also, I, Stevens and I did not uh, plan to both have a poor hat slide, but uh, moving on um, through history, again, we, we both have Hippocrates. He's obviously very important. Uh, he described hernias as an abdominal tear. Uh, again, that's pretty accurate. Uh, prescribed enema therapy, uh, which is not something we do today, although you can kind of connect the dots between, you know, somebody with bad constipation and hernias. So this guy is fascinating to me. Uh, and I have a few gratuitous slides on Celsus. He was not believed to be a physician himself, uh, but rather an encyclopedist of knowledge. Uh, but some of the first surgical uh, her hernia repairs come from his writings. He's got a book called De, De Medicina, um, which I'm trying to buy. I found the Latin version. Uh, I'm trying to find an English version. But um, at any rate, he described a lot of things that are really surprisingly accurate. Uh, he described transillumination uh, to determine between an inguinal hernia and a hydrocele. And high ligation excision of the sac was one of the big things he talked about. And so this is from his writing of an umbilical hernia repair. The patient must be laid on his back in order that the swelling, whether it be intestine or omentum, may slip back into the abdomen. But when the navel sac was then empty, some caught it between two little rods, fastened the ends of the rods tightly together so that it mortified there. So this is like an extended ligation. 
Um, some pass the needle doubly threaded through the base of the sac and then knotted the ends of each thread on opposite sides as is done also in staphyloma of the eye. From it in this way, the part beyond the ligature mortifies. Some, in addition, before tying the ends, also cut the protrusion along a marked line. So he's describing different versions of a high ligation of a hernia sac. Uh, we may not have time to read that. This really is more about trauma laparotomy, which can be used to prevent hernias. Uh, without reading the whole thing, uh, he basically says if you have an intestinal injury, the larger intestine can be sutured, not without any certain assurance, but because a doubtful hope is preferable to certain despair, uh, for occasionally it heals up. Then if either intestine is livid or pallid or black, in which case there's necessarily no sensation, all medical aid is in vain. Um, and so they, they were very, very realistic with what they uh, were able to do, but he talks further down about that you can't close the skin or the inner membrane, that you have to close both. Uh, and again, he's talking about a fascial repair. Uh, so, you know, even ancient Roman soldier, soldiers who had been uh, gutted, essentially, they, they were practicing some surprisingly uh, modern techniques on these. Uh, we're going to quickly move through the next 2,000 years. Um, so Paolo, uh, however you say this, uh, he described ligation of sac removal of the testicle, and this was the gold standard for approximately 1,000 years. Um, really, a lot of the other common features, high ligation was very common in a lot of medieval repairs, as well as cauterization. They just burnt it and hoped that everything would scar down. Uh, pretty, pretty bad. Uh, there was some gold wire that was used to wrap around to prevent uh, current recurrence. But really in the 1800s, we started to see a lot more anatomical approach. And although the repairs weren't necessarily a lot better, um, you, we had a lot of description. We started to understand the anatomy better. Uh, one of the first to do that was Sir Ashley Cooper. Obviously, he's got a ligament named after him as well. And during this time, there was what's called the Cerny technique, which was basically closing the anterior wall, which doesn't really cause the problem as we know now, and it didn't really do very much. Uh, we got a few just, uh, pictures through history of hernia repairs. Uh, there's some common themes. This is from the earlier Middle Ages. Uh, you do see the patient's in Trendelenburg position uh, and that his hands are tied. And so they're not all right. Uh, this was not just in the, the European world, but also in the Arabic world. Uh, this guy seems way too excited about his medieval hernia repair. Um, and again, you can see another example from the Renaissance of a hernia repair. Again, the patient is in Trendelenburg position. Uh, you see some examples of early anesthesia. Uh, this was more of a mechanical anesthesia than a <laughs> chemical anesthesia. Um, and then we have this as well, which is also a description of a hernia repair. I know we have certain faculty, uh, Dr. Smith looking at you, that may like to put this instrument on their tray. Uh, so things started changing a lot in the late 1800s. Actually, Christmas night of 1889, Eduardo Bassini performed the first posterior repair. And he started to develop a series, and he cut the recurrence rate from basically everyone to 10%, which was huge. Uh, and again, he used a lot of these anatomic things that have been discussed. Uh, there were a lot of uh, tissue-based repairs that came after McVeigh, Marcy, Schuldeis, and there's a whole lot more. So as far as mesh, some of the first times we see any sort of foreign prosthetic material in hernia repair came in 1894 with a doctor named Phelps who used uh, silver coils to reinforce a tissue repair. And then from there, he as well as some other surgeons that we recognize their name moved on to silver filigree, which is essentially a silver mesh to reinforce their repairs. Uh, you can imagine this did not necessarily go swimmingly, both from the rigid aspects of the metal as well as the fact that silver sulfide was very toxic. Um, and so America's lawyer, at least in speaking with silver mesh, would be correct about that. Uh, moving into the 20th century, synthetic polymers were invented in 1935, nylon being the first. In 1954, polypropylene was invented by Giulio Nada and Carl Ziegler. Uh, both of these later went on to win the Nobel Prize for their work in polymers. And the ziegler nada catalyst is used to, to turn ethylene into polyethylene, uh, which is one of their, what they won the Nobel Prize for. And so these materials started to gain some traction as far as uh, their use in hernia repair. Uh, Francis Usher was a, a surgeon based in Houston, was one of the first to begin experimenting with this. Uh, there had been a few other surgeons before that had worked with nylon and it did not work out well at all. Uh, and Dr. Usher started with Marlex and uh, later changed to polypropylene about four years after it was invented and published a series in 1958 uh, with good results on ventral hernia. And then, of course, something we should all be familiar with in 1989, Irvin Lichtenstein 
uh, published a series of 1,000 patients. He actually first published the technique in 1986 uh, and then did a 1,000 of these over the next three years and published this series. And in his series, he had zero recurrences, zero infections, uh, which has not necessarily been borne out, but it has become the gold standard of open hernia repair. Uh, one of the big papers that really kind of sealed the deal, uh, obviously MESH was very widely used by 2002, but the European Union Hernia Trialists Collaboration did a large study, and basically you can see the recurrence rates in ventral hernias was 2.7% with MESH and 8.2% without, which 8.2% still seems incredibly low. Uh, in inguinal hernia, you can see 2% versus 5%. And so, again, things were already in MESH before this time, but... Uh, that was one of the big things to, to solidify it. Uh, since then, obviously, this field has changed a lot, and we've had the introduction of laparoscopy, tap repairs, TEP repairs, and now we have robotic repairs. Ventral hernia, there was onlay described in sublays, Reeves and Stopa, uh, anterior component separation, which initially was described without mesh and later adopted to include mesh, posterior component separation, transversus dominance release, and so this field has gotten very complex, a lot of different ways that we treat hernias now. Uh, switching gears a little bit, we're going to do touch on basic science without boring everybody, but there's basically four stages of how the body reacts to mesh and how it incorporates. First is inflammatory stage where a coagulum, basically a bunch of proteins and materials attract platelets and that pulls a lot of immune cells in for an acute inflammatory response. Um, in some cases, when this happens, this is to clear an infection, clear a bacteria. If that happens, it's done. Obviously, it's not able to clear the synthetic mesh. So it moves into the chronic inflammatory phase, which is, uh, is marked primarily by monocytes and uh, turning into macrophages. From there, there's a foreign body reaction where these turn into giant cells, and they start to deposit a lot of fibroblast uh, capillary formation begins. And then the wound healing phase, which is kind of what we count on in our mesh repair, Fibroblast mediated, uh, the extracellular matrix is being uh, created, collagen is being deposited. This is the scar that's forming throughout the mesh. And so this is an important aspect of how this works. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some of the important characteristics of mesh, what makes mesh work or not. Uh, one is tensile strength. And there are several basic science experiments, we'll talk about a few in a minute, looking at what it, should the mesh's tensile strength be. Uh, and they've determined that coughing and jumping are considered to be some of the more uh, pressure-creating activities that people do, generates about 170 millimeters of mercury of intra-abdominal pressure. And so theoretically, mesh should have at least 180 millimeters of mercury of burst strength uh, to, to overcome coughing and jumping, probably more coughing. Um, elasticity is another thing. The abdominal wall is not static. And so if you look at averages, again, through some of these studies we'll talk about, uh, in males, there's about a 23% deviation from the mean in the vertical direction, 15% in the horizontal, where female is a little bit higher, 32 and 17. This is a very busy slide with tiny words, but uh, there were a few interesting ways where they determined some of the biomechanics of the abdominal wall. Uh, this one here, uh, they basically put uh, pressure... Uh, transposing a uh, urinary catheter into people, uh, filled their bladder and had them cough and jump and just measured the pressures. Um, there are some others that were done with cadavers. Uh, there's one used with a, basically a spring with a, a tension control to try to measure what the pressure some of the abdominal walls of these people are. So uh, that's just a little bit of an aside, but I thought it was interesting. And here's a bar graph um, from that same study showing the burst strengths of these different meshes. Uh, and they're looking at strong direction and weak direction, which is basically if you pull it one direction, this, what holds up better and the other direction, which holds up worse. And comparing that to some human activities and, and basically the tensile strength of the abdominal wall. Again, the linea alba is the strongest and you can see it comes across, you know, right around where some of these other things do. Uh, more into uh, important characteristics of mesh, pore size. Uh, the larger the pore of the mesh, the better things can get in. So the better uh, your immune cells can come in to clear out bacteria. Uh, also, the better uh, you know, scar tissue can form within the interstices of the mesh. Uh, these are the classifications of mesh is looking at the nanometers and how big they are. And looking at weight, these kind of go hand in hand. Um, basically, you can see at the bottom, uh, the higher the weight, the smaller the porosity. Um, and so these are kind of inversely related. Um, and just to jump off just for a side, porosity has been an issue for uh, quite a while. 
Why is this not playing? Accessories? You know, matching things. I bought a necktie and some socks. You know, the kind with elastic around the top. And a belt. And some shoes and everything. Well, you know, socks. You don't think they're too porous, do you? What do you mean? I'd hate for the hair on my leg to pop through. <laughs> so, that was a little bit of a shout out to my mother. I was raised by my parents and then Andy Griffith. Um, there's some question if Gomer was ever trained to be a brain surgeon. Um, I don't think he ever made it, though. Uh, back to the mesh. Uh, so constitution of mesh is that monofilament or multifilament. Monofilament is stiffer, less pliable, as well, better reinforced. Oh, Lord, I've lost my... Yes, extremely. Well, you may have missed the whole video. I'm sorry. If this doesn't pop up, we're going to bail to plan B. All right. It's time for plan B. I apologize. Maybe plan B. While we're waiting on that, we'll try plan A again. Okay, we'll try it again. I've also got plan A or plan B working now, so um, we'll do Andy again real quick. Well, okay, forget it. We're going to move on. So, Now maybe it'll work. Hey, Andy. Hey, Gomer. Hey, Marty. Hey, Gomer. When well, I'm all set, I went on buying spree and bought myself a whole new set of accessories. Accessories? You know, matching things. I bought my necktie and some socks. You know, the kind with elastic around the top. And a belt. And some shoes and everything. Uh, you know, socks. You don't think they're too porous, do you? What do you mean? I hate for the hair on the leg to pop through. <laughs> I'll know that. Okay. Lord help us. All right. Constitution. Monofilament. Multifilament. Uh, so monofilament's not as pliable, but it has a lot of advantages. does not harbor bacteria as easily, and essentially it's what we use for the most part. And there's absorbable mesh, not absorbable mesh. Uh, certainly permanent mesh stays longer, it's stronger, uh, but there's some issues with it, whereas absorbable mesh goes away, but it has fewer complications in a nutshell. Uh, we also look at the important characteristics of mesh. There's woven mesh and warp knitted mesh. Uh, the, the difference is, as you can see, woven's here on the left. Uh, it is basically just in and out of itself either way, whereas knitted mesh has uh, rows and courses, and warp knitted means that the course is 90 degrees to the row, I can't really explain it further than that. Uh, but warp knitted mesh has the advantage of higher porosity, it's very elastic, and it has a high tensile strength. So just quick, quickly here is a uh, proline mesh. Uh, this is a, uh, just a close-up view, and you can see the warp knitting uh, close-up of the mesh. 
So again, what kind of mesh types were the early materials? Uh, nylon, Oron, Dacron, Teflon, none of these panned out. Uh, Marlex was used for a while. Uh, Marlex is also what hula hoops were made out of by the Whammo Corporation. But really, polypropylene is, um, you know, became the forefront of mesh use. Uh, for one of the advantages, it could be autoclaved. It didn't melt in the autoclave, and so that has some obvious advantages with sterility. Uh, there's three types of mesh, macroporous, microporous, and then there's a combination. Uh, the materials, polypropylene or PTFE, they're usually some type of those two. Obviously, there's also vicryl meshes and some other things. Uh, second generation mesh basically has two different types of materials. So these are going to be your coated meshes or ones that are reinforced with titanium sometimes. Something that's not just simply polypropylene or PTFE. Third generation are biologic meshes. meshes. So these come from usually either the dermis, uh, human porcine, or fetal bovine. There's also some uh, uh, porcine, uh, submucosa, bovine pericardium, some different things that these are used. Basically, they're decellularized, decellularized where they, only the, the structural components are left. This is ideally to allow uh, repopulation, revascularization of the, the body's own tissues. Uh, they don't trigger an inflammatory response like the foreign bodies do. Uh, they're very expensive, uh, and the data is uh, kind of so-so on some of these things. So, what's the problem? Electing to have surgery is not a decision that most people take lightly because they understand how risky any procedure can be. I mean, medical errors are one of the leading causes of preventable deaths in the United States, and most of those occur on the surgical side. On top of that, there are complications that can arise from anesthesia, the possibility of infection, and even the amount of pain that the patients have to suffer when they go through a surgical procedure. But in some cases, surgery is the only option, and that's the case with most hernias. Each year, hundreds of thousands of hernia surgeries are performed in the United States. There are numerous types of hernias, but the two most common hernias are the ventral hernias and the equal hernias. The ventral hernia is a bulge that uh, occurs at the abdominal wall muscle, and an equal hernia is a hernia near the groin. Many years ago, a product came out on the market. It was called the Kugel Mesh Patch. That hernia patch was a horrific product that was made of a plastic chemical polymer and had a ring around the patch that was supposed to break, and it ended up dislodging the patient's skin, their abdomen, or their intestines. People suffered debilitating injuries, even they even died from this product. Turns out that was only the tip of the iceberg. Since the Kugel Mesh days, medical device companies have continued to produce devices that supposedly have this innovative technology in them that are nothing more than marketing ploys that involve little to no science and a whole lot of experimental medicine and marketing. Thanks to the FDA's medical device clearance process, which is totally inadequate, these devices don't have to be independently verified as to their safety. For example, a company called Atrium releases a product called Secure Mesh. The Secure Mesh was a mesh patch that was coated with omega-3 acids. Basically, fish oil goo is the best way to describe it. This goo causes severe reactions inside the human body, at least infections, adhesions, and can even cause a person's death. So I picked him. He was the most unbiased person on YouTube. Um, and his just knowledge of an eagle hernias was fascinating. So, uh, so anyway, but he does raise some points. America's lawyer does raise some points. Um, so... There were issue, there was, this was out before 2011, but uh, the FDA in 2011 issued a safety alert talking about transvaginal mesh. And these are meshes used uh, to basically prevent pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, it was a mesh placed around to help support the, um, the urinary system. Uh, and it has been pretty much a disaster. Uh, in 2018, there were 73,000 uh, people who had filed liability claims against the company. And there are three, three and a half million women out there in the world who have this transvaginal mesh, and it really has caused a lot of problems. Um, and so it was a pretty short leap to go from vag transvaginal mesh to all mesh. And so if you sur Google surgical mesh, uh, this is what you get, not surprising. Uh, if you go ahead and click enter, this is what you see. So again, what our patients are doing when we say we're going to repair your hernia uh, we're going to use some mesh. They type surgical mesh into Google, and they're inundated with, you know, all these things. 
Uh, but it's not just the lawyers. Uh, there's a lot in the media. This is a big thing in England right now. Uh, the BBC has got a lot of uh, series on this. Uh, this is one of the bigger uh, articles they wrote about this affecting more than 100,000 patients. Um, there are actually anti-mesh societies in England. Uh, it's really, it's really a, a big thing there. Uh, we've got it in our news as well. There are just some other headlines you can see. Uh, FDA orders people to start stop using these. Even in our own media, uh, the general surgeon uses just about every issue has something about inguinal hernia or hernia repair and mesh lately. Uh, this is from the British Medical Journal. Uh, may have affected up to 170,000 patients. And so, again, this is a, really a furor over there, and I think it's coming here. So what are some of the issues that people talk about with mesh? Uh, this is from one of, uh, this is from a lawyer's website. Again, one of the first ones that you click on. Uh, this live chat window moves wherever you move to give you a chance at any point to contact them. Uh, but they say talk to your surgeon uh, or call us if you have any of these things, pain, bleeding, blood in the urine, uh, fistula formation. These are serious, you know, uh, these are serious problems that can be associated with mesh. Uh, there are other mesh failure symptoms they want you to look for, abdominal pain, tenderness, cramping, bloating, constipation, diarrhea. Uh, there are a lot of vague things that they would like to talk to you about, hernia repairs as well, uh, flu-like symptoms. Uh, these are you know, things we may think is re less recognizable as a, as a complication of mesh. So to go to the first one, this idea of uh, mesh and going in throughout the body, um, causing these vague generalized symptoms, tiredness, lethargy, things like this has been referred to as mesh syndrome. And the study that you see quoted most often, this is from a Canadian uh, rheumatologist who took 40 patients who were referred to him for autoimmune disorders who had had mesh previously implanted and found that they all had autoimmune disorders. Uh, wrote a paper linking this. Uh, a lot of these complaints were tiredness uh, or myalgias, uh, if, but if you look at these patients, most of them had pre-existing problems, either an immunodeficiency, autoimmune disease, pre-existing allergic disease. Uh, this study has been uh, criticized for selection bias. Uh, around the same time, this is a big meta-analysis, which I'm a little hesitant to put up here at this point, but it's on the talk, uh, where basically they took uh, uh, 29,000 people and basically it was a case control study and so they took people who had undergone hernia repair and then as a control used people who had undergone colonoscopy. And they're looking for a lot of these symptoms uh, that you see or that, that's discussed with these uh, autoimmune disorders and basically found that there was no change between, between people who had gotten a mesh versus people who had a colonoscopy. So I uh, really refuted this idea of a mesh syndrome and there's not really been out anything out there to prove a strong link but something that, to consider. Uh, chronic pain is another one of the big things you see, especially from the BBC, people that have just horrible pain after, after hernia repair. Uh, and so a big, uh, another meta-analysis, but this, this kind of made some waves. This was a Cochrane review uh, from 2018. Uh, and they basically compared mesh repair to tissue-based repair in inguinal hernias and found that basically for every mesh repair you do, you, have, you prevent one recurrence per every 46 surgeries. Uh, there was a high rate of seroma in mesh repair, uh, but there's a lower rate of iatrogenic injuries. Uh, mesh repair patients had shorter hospital stays and faster recoveries. And they actually, the data in this study trended the opposite direction from a lot of the claims. It was not significant, but there was a trend towards less pain in the mesh patients versus the tissue repair patients. Uh, I've talked to some of the older surgeons who used to do a lot of tissue repairs. Um, and it sounds like it was a pretty painful procedure. There's a lot of pain complaints from those patients. If you think about it with all the tension that you've got on their inguinal canal. Uh, another study looking at pain, this is looking at post-chronic pain after open mesh, again, in inguinal hernias. Uh, they followed 932 outpatient hernias um, and found that some of the predictors of chronic pain, their idea was what can we do to, which patients are gonna be the ones that have pain. Uh, the ones who recurred, the ones who had complications, had more pain than those who didn't. Uh, makes sense. Heavyweight mesh use was associated with more pain. A uh, higher preoperative visual analog scale, which is basically like a pain scale 1 to 10. Patients who had higher pain, pre-op had higher pain, post-op, and then age. Uh, this is a British study uh, who really found some of the th same things, but the main thing was that pre-op pain predicted post-op pain. Or to repeat one of the surgical adages, you operate on pain, you get pain. Um, and so patients who are predisposed to pain or having more pain from the surgery tended to have pain afterwards. 
Uh, the, one of the last things we'll talk about is uh, what we've heard a couple times in the videos is the 510K pathway. Um, and this is the overview off the FDA website. Uh, but I've got one more video clip uh, that will explain it pretty succinctly and better than I can. Cubes is right. I mean, when is it not? But my man Cubes nailed it again there. If you're saying something is FDA cleared, is in no way proof that a device actually works. It's a phrase that can promise way more than it delivers. Like when a cereal describes itself as part of a complete breakfast. That doesn't really mean anything. Anything can technically be part of a complete breakfast. If you ingest it alongside oatmeal, yogurt, granola, fruit salad and a glass of orange juice, heroin is part of a complete breakfast. <laughs> And the way most products get cleared is through a loophole in the system called the 510K pathway. It wasn't actually a bad idea when they initially came up with it. Basically, the FDA wouldn't make companies go through a strenuous testing process if their device was substantially similar to one that had come before. That way, they wouldn't stifle innovation. But it was only supposed to apply narrowly. The problem is, nowadays, more than 80% of medical devices are cleared through the 510K loophole including around 400 implanted medical devices every year. Those are the ones that go inside your body. And that whole idea of being substantially equivalent to devices that came before has some real problems with it, because it can essentially become a high-stakes game of telephone. Let, let me show you. In 2008, a company called Depew received FDA clearance for a hip replacement based on its substantial equivalence to six previous devices, all of which were cleared because of their similarity to devices before that and devices before that and before that, all the way back to hips that were on the market in 1975. Now, incredibly, some of those devices have since been taken off the market by their manufacturers because of their high failure rates, but under FDA rules, Depew could still use them as a basis for getting their hips cleared. And the thing is, Depew's hip really would have... So, this is uh, something you find a lot too, is this, this 510K clearance process. and. Um, there probably are some issues with it. I think certainly trying to look at every single thing that's ever put out would also slow innovation down, uh, but it's something to think about. Uh, so what is the role for primary hernia or primary pair of hernias? And so we'll look at ventral hernias first, just to basically say there's not a lot. Um, there's not a lot of data, certainly recently, about primary repair of ventral hernias. Uh, this is just from up to date. Basically, the only thing that they recommend closing primarily is a primary umbilical hernia. Uh, even an incisional hernia less than a centimeter, they cite concerns of you know patients' wound healing properties, and recommend mesh repair for this and any ventral hernia over one centimeter. Uh, the quote of um, recurrence rate of greater than 50% on primary repair alone. So really, the only thing that has been out uh, is another option other than just sewing the two ends back together was the originally described component separation, uh, which just in brief is a, a separation of the external oblique to allow uh, less tension on the midline to try to pull the midline together. Uh, in 2011, the, the Plastic Surgery Journal, this was published, and they basically looked at people who had had just the classic open component separation without mesh uh, versus the modified component separation technique with mesh. Uh, the patients without mesh had a recurrence rate of 27%. The patients with mesh was 16.7. And actually, the complication rate was a lot higher in these patients, 59% uh, complication rate without mesh versus 21% with. Now, there are a lot of other modifications uh, without getting into the details and to the weeds of the ways we can do this even better. But just as best of, as we could of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, uh, mesh is clearly superior. Uh, what about inguinal hernias, or inguinal? I couldn't remember how to spell it. Um, so, Bassini and Marcy uh, are mostly historic at this point. Recurrence rates around 33 to 34 percent are typically what you see. Uh, the shoulder ice repair is, is really hailed as the gold standard in a lot of, especially the anti-mesh uh, contingent. Uh, and if you look at their data, they report recurrence rates of around 1 percent, give or take. Uh, the shoulder ice, there have also been studies looking at uh, repairs done outside the shoulder ice clinic, and you're seeing recurrence rates of, you know, similar to theirs up to 15%. Uh, they also have found a chronic groin pain rate of approximately 5.4% versus 2.2 after laparoscopic repair. Uh, again, that's a little bit apples and oranges, but there may be better ways. Another thing that was interesting, if you want to have your hernia repaired by the shoulder ice clinic, you must fall and you must 
this is one of the requirements is they're very stringent on who they operate on, which may not be a bad lesson for everybody, uh, but I would not be eligible to get my hernia repaired at the Shoulders Clinic. Um, and so they're, you know, they're selecting out patients that are going to succeed, which may be part of the reason their numbers look so good. And also, they're very good at what they do because they do it all day, every day. So what about mesh versus non-mesh repair of inguinal hernias? Uh, this is a study uh, from England uh, looking at 300 patients, and they followed these patients out 10 years um, and looked at the recurrence rates, which for mesh repairs were around 1%. Uh, non-mesh repairs were around 17%. These were all open uh, primary or open hernia repairs. They didn't find any significant correlation between age, expertise, obesity, COPD, really anything um, other than just recurrence rate. Uh, the final thing I'll talk about, because this pops up again and again and again, is the DeSarda technique, which is actually pretty slick. It, uh, without going into a lot of details, it, it is kind of a mimic of a Liechtenstein technique, but instead of using a piece of prosthetic mesh, you're using a portion of the anterior inguinal canal, or the anterior wall of the inguinal canal, sewing it down to the floor, covering the defect, and then having more tension over the anterior side. Uh, there's not a lot of data. Uh, there's some small international series uh, that show basically no difference between the two, uh, but there's pretty sparsity of data and there's not uh, certainly not a lot of American studies at all yet. So uh, you see this open a lot. I watched the video. It, it was neat. I don't know if it's going to be borne out in the data, but that may be a consideration. Uh, so kind of to wrap things up, what are the takeaways? Uh, you know, mesh does have issues. We've all seen them. I've pulled mesh from inside of a sigmoid colon before that had eroded through. Um, these are serious things, and we need to be telling our patients about it. Uh, if you have a knee replacement, you have a really long talk about what if this gets infected, what does that mean? And I think we can probably do a better job of that. Uh, you don't want to scare your patients, especially with all this stuff out in the media, but there is an important portion of being, having them inform what the risks are, but also why this is important and why we use mesh, because I think it is the way to treat the vast majority of hernias. Um, and then uh, newer is not always better. Some of the things that we saw in the videos, there have been products recalled. There have been some really bad issues with some of these things. And so uh, an orthopedic surgeon I used to work with had a advice, never be the first to adopt a new technology, but don't be the last either. And that's probably pretty sound. Um, and then finally, and this I think goes back to everything, is use your judgment, don't know how to do the operation, know how to operate. You gotta consider your patient, you know, is this person, is this, and what kind of tissues are we working with? Who's, how is this patient gonna tolerate this versus the other? Um, and you really, there's so much intricacy and so much nuance in this that you can lean on a lot of this data, but you know, ultimately you have to consider what is the best thing for the person who's you know, lying on your operating table, um, and that's, that just takes a lot of experience and um, that's one thing reason I really appreciate um, the training I've had here is getting a lot of experience and having to make some of those decisions and trying to learn how to be a surgeon and how, how to operate. Uh, here are my works cited. Uh, some people think that I've been groomed for this for a long time. I don't know. I don't see it. I don't know where that comes from uh, and there's certainly nothing to indicate that that would continue. Um, but I would like to thank my fellow chief residents. Uh, this was not definitely not on Erlinger property yesterday uh, when this picture was taken. Uh, they've been just great support. They've been great guys to work with. Uh, really been, we've, I think everyone's been very supportive and, and we've gotten through this really well. Uh, I'd like to thank my family. Uh, it's been really incredible to be able to work with, with my dad. Uh, you can see a picture on here on the left. My mom has also been great support. I figure she liked this picture and her element. And then, uh, obviously, my wife and my two children uh, have been through this as much as we have and really appreciate them. So probably no time for questions, but one more picture of the girls. That, yes, not to, not to bark. Willing to answer questions, yeah. Use the mic, please. Sure. <laughs> that, that, was really, that was really good. Uh, Appreciate you doing that. I, I guess the question I have, and when you reviewed all this, there's a difference between direct inguinal hernias and indirect inguinal hernias. And it's, 
were these separated out as far as recurrence rates go? The other thing is, should do we need to repair the floor of every inguinal, uh, inguinal hernia if it's an indirect hernia? Is it enough to ligate the sac if the floor is intact and are we just overusing mesh in people that we don't even need to put mesh in or any sort of prosthetic in? Uh, to answer your first question, most of these studies I looked, and this, again, this could have turned into a six-hour talk if you really started slicing and dicing all the different things. Uh, most of these are not distinguishing direct versus indirect. I think that probably has to do with this, the difficulties of reporting and, and, and all of that. So I didn't see anything specifically into direct or indirect, but it's a good point because they're really very different entities as far as, you know, the patient's tissues and, and what you may be able to do. As far as closing the floor, um, I think it almost never hurts to do that. Um, I think as much as you can restore the patient's natural anatomy, the better. Uh, as far as whether every patient needs mesh or not, uh, I think most of them do, probably not all of them. Uh, again, if you have concerns for infection, or there, there are probably some instances where you don't. Uh, but I think your occurrence rates are going to be higher. Again, there may be some new techniques out there that may kind of split the gap between the two. Mentioning, uh, mentioning surveying the audience, as, as, as Dr. Sharp said, and, and technique, I just want to ask one brief question. How many residents have ever seen a relaxing incision in a growing hernia? One. 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 Too. Yeah, they, then they've done a case with me. Uh, so that's so that and so you can look that up. We won't elaborate that. I think one other observation I've I've several, told residents this several times. When I came to town, you wanted to operate on on things or general surgery. You want to do hernias. I did a. I looked back at my first years, first uh, five years of hernia cases. And I had done more recurrent hernias than I had virgin hernias. And so one thing you find with hernias, and that's the problem with a lot of that data, is that if you had a hernia fixed by somebody and it recurs, you don't go back to see them. Oh, it's very difficult. And so the data a long term is, is really jaded in that direction. I think almost everybody's recurrence rate is probably higher than, than it's listed there. Now, if there is one thing that an electronic medical record might do, <laughs> over time we might get accurate information or something like that. If you truly can, can access everything in somebody's medical record over a lifetime, we might get a, a true study of that. It's, it's one place that I've thought, well, that might work. Gavin, if you want to come on up uh, and be putting your slides up. Thank you very much, Steve. That was, that was a Thank great you. job. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, let me just uh, again mention the, uh, the plan for tonight, 6 o'clock at the Weston uh, is the time we start. And um, again, as Dr. Witherspoon reminded us at 1 o'clock, Mary Cat and Mary Catherine's here now. If she wanted to raise her hand, she could tell you how to get to her mom's place for the swimming party. Looks like the... Okay, everybody's welcome. Everybody's welcome. Good deal. All right. So we look forward to everybody. Uh, uh, and, and once again, I especially want to thank and appreciate our new residents coming in. We're, we're excited that you're here and look forward to six years with you guys or as long as you're going to be here anyway. So our next uh, speaker is Gavin Wilkes. Gavin's a native... Alabamian and uh, had a good contingent of family uh, with us last night uh, to get to know them. And I see that part of them or all of them are here again this morning and uh, welcome and uh, we're glad to have you. Uh, Gavin has finished both the general surgery residency and the critical care fellowship and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be going down to University of Alabama uh, to uh, work there uh, and uh, as a trauma critical care surgeon in Tuscaloosa. Um, his, the, the program says he's going to talk on peptic ulcer disease and he can either explain or I can that I will briefly say that that got burned somehow last night and so now he's going to give a talk that's uh, not, not that title but I know it'll be good. So Gavin, look forward to it.
Yeah, um, the original talk that I was going to do was on peptic ulcer disease. Um, I have been working on it for quite some time. I delved into the history uh, of surgery uh, of it, and I was actually looking forward to giving it. Um, but last night, through an act of God, I guess, my computer died, and this is the only talk that I had saved on a jump drive. So I dusted it off, and I apologize in advance, y'all. <clears throat> so through my, um, through my time uh, doing my critical care fellowship, um, it was uh, really evident to me that we spend a lot of money doing a lot of things to people to try to make outcomes better. And <clears throat> as you sit back and think, it's like sometimes maybe it's the, th the, the things that don't cost so much, the easier things to do um, that may provide benefit. Um, and one of the things that I kept on kind of going back to was just because someone is intubated um, on a ventilator doesn't really mean that they can't get out of bed or move around. Like, why? Um, so I started looking into this. Um, and really the first uh, mention that I found of this uh, was uh, a letter to the editor of Chest in 1975 by a couple of uh, thoracic surgeons who had uh, noted that uh, their patients um, who were ventilated uh, and on bed rest, um, that they were needl needlessly predisposed to muscular and skeletal wasting, thromboembolism, <clears throat> and decubitus. And they came up with what you see over there on the side um, as a way of the patient to be able to ambulate uh, while they were still being ventilated. And through um, their anecdotal evidence, um, they said that it's their impression that early ambulation <coughs> weaning uh, has been facilitated and hastened uh, and the problems pro of prolonged bed rest uh, are minimized. In another surgery journal uh, in 1980, um, on a symposium on respiratory care and surgery, there was one mention about aggressive mobilization and frequent position changes uh, in the management of atelectasis and pneumonia in patients who are mechanically ventilated. From 1980 um, to the early 2000s, I could not really find much in the literature as far as um, being aggressive with trying to get these uh, critically ill patients um, physical therapy. And I think that has to do with these patients are in the ICU, they're critically ill. The assumption is if they're there that they're too sick to be able to get up and, and participate in therapy. Um, and then also there's the fear that goes along with it. Uh, these patients, uh, some of which are intubated, central lines, pressors, what have you, um, there's always a fear that something could go wrong and if it does that these patients would uh, suffer um, quite dr uh, dramatically. Um, so this first study, um, which was published in 2007, um, <clears throat> just looked at the safety uh, and feasibility of getting uh, these respiratory uh, failure patients up and moving. Um, so this included medical, surgical, and trauma patients um, that were in their kind of respiratory step-down unit. Um, they excluded patients um, who had been on mechanical ventilation for less than four days, um, which is kind of interesting as we go forward. Um, the way that they assess the readiness um, of someone um, <clears throat> to participate uh, was they had to be uh, responsive to verbal stimuli. Um, also, uh, they had to have an FI2 of 60% uh, or less, um, and they could not have any sort of hypotension episodes when they stood up, and they couldn't be on any sort of vasopressors. So out of 100 patients, uh, they had just under 1,500 activity events. Um, sitting on the side of the bed, sitting up in the chair, and eventually ambulating. So their main focus was to see if anything bad happened, right? Um, so they had 14 adverse events, none of which were really clinically significant, um, for an overall um, adverse event rate of less than 1%, um, which was obviously good. So if you looked at their breakdown, though, um, the portion of patients that were really interesting was this almost 600 um, that were endotracheally intubated um, because those are the patients that people seem to be, in my experience, the most nervous whenever I was trying to get people to get up and move in the ICU. Those are the patients that I would have the most pushback from. So um, <clears throat> as we had talked about earlier, 
um, they said that they wanted to look at this four days. They wanted um, their patients uh, to be on the ventilator for at least four days. The topic of the talk is early. Um, and if you look at their um, hospital admission days um, to the time that they were enrolled in this, uh, they were in the hospital almost a week at least, if not a week and a half. Um, so that really doesn't fit this whole criteria of early. Um, the next uh, paper that came out of um, in the Critical Care Journal uh, in 2008 um, looked more at moving that mark up. Okay, can we do this sooner? Um, as patients become stable from their initial phase of their critical illness, um, can we start working with them sooner? Um, and also, what they wanted to show was that there was actually some benefit to doing this. Up until this point, there had been really no papers um, to show that there was a true benefit of early um, physical therapy in these patients. Um, their exclusion criteria are here. Um, a lot of these you'll see is just um, dependent on the paper um, because there was no real um, guidance uh, whenever this was kind of first starting out. So they had two groups, uh, the group they called usual care, um, which was just the turning of a patient every two hours because normally done, passive range of motion, uh, which is normally done. And then physical therapy is ordered by whoever the attending physician was, whenever that may be. Um, in the protocol group, um, they had initiation um, of therapy within 48 hours of mechanical ventilation. So all the patients um, were automatically, you know, physical therapy was ordered on those. The way that they did this progressive mobility, um, and this um, was used by several of the papers going forward as a way um, for patients to progress um, through to the next level. Um, so starting out, you can see um, for unconscious patients, it's just passive range of motion um, and turning the patient. Um, if the patients are conscious, and the way they described that was following three of five simple commands. Um, they had the normal, the low level passive range of motion uh, turning. Um, and then also they would work on this sitting position um, for 20 minutes, three times a day. Um, this doesn't have to be um, necessarily sitting on the edge of the bed, but at least being able to, to sit up like in a, in a chair um, in the bed. Um, and then once the patients could uh, move their arm against gravity, they move on to the next level, doing more, which is sitting on the side of the bed. Once that they can move their legs, then they start working on transferring and standing, and it gradually goes on. Um, <clears throat> for this group, um, they held mobilization um, for 24 hours in patients who had a MAP of less than 65 or on new vasoactive drugs. Um, or if they had an increase of PEEP. Um, so the patients didn't get evaluated until the next day. It was a whole 24 hours. Um, so that's a, you know, a pretty big lag time um, if you're trying to implement something like this. The important part of this was there were no significant um, adverse events in the protocol group. Um, nobody died because they got up. Nobody got extubated because they got up. Um, but what they were able to show that the people who had this, you know, automatic 48 hours of being in the, you know, ICU and making the check marks, um, those people, they started getting physical therapy sooner, um, 11 uh, versus five days, um, which is significant, uh, almost a week sooner. Um, you also see that the ICU um, length of stay uh, is also about a day and a half shorter. Uh, and then, <clears throat> not, um, not surprising as well, um, their hospital length of stay was about three days different. Um, not statistically significant was the ventilator days, um, but uh, clinically, uh, I think a day is, uh, is pretty significant. Also, what was interesting about this, um, we talk a lot um, in our grand rounds when we give talks up here, you know, Dr. Burns is kind of ingrained in us the importance of uh, paying attention to what things cost in medicine. So it was kind of interesting to me that um, they showed that even with creating this uh, new positions, they had three people that were on this mobility team 
um, whenever they would work with these patients. Even though um, that they had to hire more people, um, the cost per patient was actually about $3,000 less uh, in this group. <clears throat> this um, here is the first randomized control trial. Um, whenever they're combining physical therapy, occupational therapy, along with um, sedation um, from um, their medications because they're uh, mechanically ventilated. They also took patients who were functionally active at baseline. So this Barthel index, um, 70 um, is the number of someone who can live on their own. Um, so that's scored as you can see here. So they took healthy individuals who were living independently. They came into the medical ICU for whatever reason. And they wanted to see if by doing this protocolized early mobilization, along with timing it up with their sedation from other medications, were we able to get people back to their baseline whenever they leave the hospital? So the control group, um, 55 people, same thing as before. Um, they had therapy that was ordered by the physician. Um, the intervention group, uh, 49 um, patients, they had automatic orders um, on day one. Um, again, um, the unresponsive patients with a passive range of motion just like before. Um, and the responsive patients, they would time their therapy uh, with the sedation um, of their medication, or the sedation vacation. Um, and their uh, criteria here um, is pretty similar to what we've seen before. Um, nothing really surprising here um, as far as the contraindications. At the bottom, uh, this is, uh, will be important going forward. Um, they did not um, say that CRT was a contraindication for someone uh, undergoing um, active um, range of motion or exercises and physical therapy. Uh, here's their data. <clears throat> Again, not surprising. Uh, the time uh, initiation of therapy sessions was much quicker uh, in the intervention group, one day versus seven days. Um, and the time that it took them to meet the milestones of getting up, walking, whatever it may be, was much sooner uh, as well in the intervention group uh, compared to the control group. More people went home, um, as you can see here. The um, duration of mechanical ventilation, uh, again, was not statistically significant, but again, two days, um, I think it's clinically significant. Um, they did show here that the, uh, the length of stay uh, for the ICU uh, was approximately two days shorter. Um, the, the, excuse me, <coughs> hospital length of stay, however, did not change for them. Um, but uh, their main goal of returning to functional independent status at hospital discharge was 59% in the interventional group versus 35% um, in the control group. So that was significant. They're taking these people that just because of this early therapy and combining it with the timing that they're off of their uh, sedating medications, the vast majority of these people were able to get back to what they were doing whenever they came in. Um, this here is just a graphic representation of the same thing. And um, their interpretation of the study uh, essentially states exactly what we've just talked about. So we're different, right? We have surgery patients, um, and in particular trauma patients is where I was doing my fellowship in. And all of these studies were done um, mostly in medical patients, especially the um, randomized trials. Um, some of the others had uh, surgical trauma patients mixed into it, but this was the first uh, study um, that was done solely looking uh, at the trauma and burn population. Um, is it safe in this um, aspect of our population? Uh, so this was done at UAB um, <clears throat> from 2008 uh, to 2010. Um, at the 2009, <coughs> May of 2009 mark is when they implemented an early uh, mobility program. So they just looked at the year preceding and the year after. Um, and again, they did that exact same um, progressive sort of buildup as before. Um, their contraindications um, were a little bit different than what we've seen before. Um, their FiO2 uh, was 50 instead of uh, 60. 
Um, also, um, they said that people with femoral access um, could not be up uh, and moving. Um, but other than that, nothing was really different than what we had seen before. <clears throat> uh, their patient populations uh, were pretty similar. Um, their injury severity score um, was a little bit different uh, pre and post, but uh, 22 and 23 is pretty similar to me. Um, <clears throat> they did show um, that by implementing this uh, early mobilization in their trauma patients that um, they did uh, get out of the hospital sooner, um, approximately uh, three days. Um, they were also <clears throat> on event uh, fewer days, but again, uh, it did not reach statistical significance as we have kind of seen before. Um, some of the measures uh, that hospitals are uh, measured by, <laughs> um, <clears throat> DVT and pneumonia, um, those, are, uh, those are big ones. Um, those were both statistically improved um, just by the implementation of their uh, early mobilization protocol, which I thought was really interesting. <clears throat> um, in 2014, uh, because of a lot of literature and research had been going into this mobilization and people were doing it more and people were starting to, to push what they were comfortable with, um, there was a large um, international group that got together and they decided to put forth some sort of recommendations because everything until now um, had been, okay, well, we're comfortable if our patients are on this much oxygen or if they're not on this much vasopressor. So this group, what they did, they sat down and they came, this may not project well, um, they came up with um, some criteria for people to go off of. Is this safe? Is it not? It gave people some guidelines. Um, again, there's nothing in this that's terribly surprising. Um, I will point out the FiO2 of 60%, which was a little bit different uh, from that UAB study in the trauma population. Um, but other than that, um, everything on here is kind of as you would expect. Um, they say that um, femoral lines are okay, um, that there's no reason that you can't exercise someone in bed with femoral access. Um, <clears throat> this is the ECMO category, which I will talk about briefly. Um, they were hesitant on recommending um, ECMO patients um, ambulating here. <clears throat> um, after, this, uh, after this came out, people had more guidance on what could be considered safe and it gave some people a little more um, structure in which to guide some future research. Um, <clears throat> and what they did, uh, they looked at um, non-mechanically ventilated patients as well as mechanically ventilated patients um, because up until now, a lot of this had just been done in the uh, people on vents. It was the main focus. So they said, well, what about how does this affect um, patients who are not mechanically ventilated? Do patients also um, benefit from this uh, no matter why they're in the ICU essentially? Um, so again, they had pre and post. Um, their intervention group, though, for their for the post, they had PT, OT, and speech. Um, so that is very difficult to do. They would also work with therapists for approximately 60 minutes a day, uh, which is a lot. Um, this was done at NYU, so I guess that's easier for them to do that. Um, <clears throat> this is their ICU patients um, in the pre-process um, improvement group, um, only, uh, or excuse me, 20% of patients whenever they left the ICU um, had not, not gotten out of bed, right? So after they um, started this, this process improvement project, where they started this early mobility, that decreased by 15%. So more patients were getting up, um, and also more patients were ambulating at the time of um, discharge from the ICU. It went up from 8 to 25 percent. Also, they noticed that their length of stay uh, from the ICU um, was significantly lower uh, by about a day uh, and about two and a half days uh, for their floor patients. They also um, showed what we had seen previously, um, that people were able to go back home without as much support. Um, so there was a significant increase there as well. And similarly um, to 
one of the earlier studies that we talked about. Um, they showed um, a net savings of uh, one and a half million um, per year uh, because of this implementation only. Um, so this is this net, I think it was 2.2 .2 overall is what they saved, but once they did the salaries and benefits and all that, that's where it kind of worked out at. This was the uh, first uh, international uh, multi-center randomized control trial just in surgical patients, um, just mechanically ventilated for less than 48 hours. They looked at people who were functionally independent at baseline as well. Um, <clears throat> and their exclusion criteria are very similar to what, we have, uh, what we've seen before. Um, and the reason that this study um, was so important is because um, previous to this, um, there had been no surgery literature on this based around this sedation, vacation, protocolized vent wean type setting that a lot of people are used to now. So they wanted to take as much of the bias out of this as possible. So they had 96 patients um, that were their standard care, which was still the very protocolized, you know, vacation, sedation, vent, wean, all that. Um, all they did on top of that uh, was just the early goal-directed mobilization. Um, here is their um, way that they kind of looked at this. Uh, over here, the level of no activity is people who have unstable spines, elevated ICP, going to die in 24 hours. Those patients you don't do anything with. Well, <clears throat> if their condition improves, then you are okay for passive range of motion. Okay, once they meet the check boxes, they're following commands and whatever, then they slowly uh, progress on. And their goal was to see um, how many people were able to ambulate um, and was there more mobility in the intervention group versus um, the control. And not surprisingly, um, 52 um, percent versus uh, 25 um, were ambulating um, in the intervention and control group. So again, um, that is, it's significant. Uh, you'll see, as we've seen before, uh, people are going home um, instead of going to rehab. Um, they're not needing as much assistance whenever they leave the hospital. This shows uh, the functional independence uh, at discharge, which was their primary outcome. Um, it's just restated. Uh, the ICU length of stay was significant, uh, three days less uh, in the intervention group. Uh, the hospital length of stay um, was also uh, significantly different, um, 15 days versus 21 days, so almost a week there. Um, <clears throat> So clearly getting patients up early is beneficial to them, right? Um, it's, it's safe, um, that's been shown. Um, I think for me personally, whenever I was trying to convince um, the, the staff and the units that it was okay, it was more of that sort of fear type issue, okay? Um, and once you got over that, people really got behind this and excited about it. Um, and specifically, there were a few more hurdles. So I got over the ventilation issue, right? So now comes the issue of CRT um, and femoral catheters. Um, <clears throat> there were specifically a couple papers that talked about femoral catheters. Um, this one here in the Critical Care Journal, again, it was just uh, medical patients, um, but they were all femoral catheters, a uh, hundred of them. Um, they have their uh, mobility here in bed, um, cycling, sitting. There were no adverse events, but um, if you look down here at the bottom, um, nobody stood or walked in this group. So it's fine for them to get up, um, sit up, get out of bed, um, but nobody in this group actually ambulated. Um, this, um, has to do with uh, CRT. Um, there was a prospective trial with a PrismaFlex machine. They also just wanted to show um, that there would be no adverse events. 
um, with therapy. Passive, low level, high level, it's the same as before. Um, what's really important here um, is, is the number, what I wanted to focus on, was the number of femoral catheters in each group. Um, so 11 were in the passive group, um, the, the sitting group was nine, and then the, they actually had people that were able to stand up um, and take a few steps. Um, again, in none of these patients who had femoral catheters, they had no issues. Um, this uh, was added in because uh, of the, this is a different type of uh, dialysis machine. Um, so I just wanted to show that patients who were also on the next stage who had access, um, they had no issues either with CRT. Um, it's safe with, with either um, of the uh, devices. And then um, something that I really started to get behind whenever I was um, doing my fellowship, I had a handful of ECMO patients, um, one in which I think that probably all of the residents I had some interaction with at some point in time. Um, I got really excited about getting her up. I just made this my goal, right? Every single day, I'm in her room, we're gonna do this, like this is what's happening. It took me a good month of, you know, building people up and, and trying to get people on board to do this. And a lot of people thought I was crazy. Um, there were some attendings that I didn't wanna talk about it to. Uh, because I was afraid of what I would be told. Um, <clears throat> but um, in 2014, uh, this paper came out. This was one of the very first ECMO papers that came out um, like this. Uh, they had 100 uh, consecutive ECMO patients, 35 of which participated in physical therapy um, during ECMO. Um, so those are the patients that they looked at. Um, the majority of which um, had uh, VV cannulas, uh, the same... Um, jugular uh, VV cannulas that we use here. Um, and then they had some femoral and VAs as well. This is my patient um, for y'all that don't know. This here is the cannula that's going in um, to the main vein here uh, in her neck uh, that kind of that empties down. Uh, it gives oxygenated blood um, to her heart um, and then takes the deoxygenated blood uh, back to the machine, which you can't see over here. Um, so this is the first day that she got up. Um, this was exciting for everybody involved. Um, the time um, of initiation of ECMO um, for the first physical therapy uh, in, this, uh, in this study was about two days, which is really quick. Um, it took me, I think, 80 or something like that. Um, but slow progress is still progress. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, they assessed their level of activity based on this one through eight scale of nothing up to ambulation. Um, so this is her sitting in the chair. So this is a level five. She did get up to a seven. Um, there are some people that I think say that she took a few steps whenever she was actually on ECMO, but I don't think she did. Um, but anyways, I, sh we did, I think, a great job with this in particular. Um, I felt s a sense of accomplishment over this. This was something that I had set out on over the course of a year to do. And finally, at the very end of, um, of my fellowship, I was able um, to get up and walk with her. She was not decannulated then, but she got up, she left the hospital, she's doing well now, she's on transplant list. I don't know if anybody here knows any updates on that. Last I heard, she's doing great. Um, <clears throat> so in summary, early mobilization um, is absolutely a team effort. Uh, there's no way that any of this could be done uh, without the help of your staff. Uh, it is safe and feasible, you just have to be smart about it. Um, I do think that it gets people off the ventilator sooner. Um, I do think that people leave the ICU and are able to leave the hospital sooner. People are able to go home um, instead of having to go uh, to facilities. Um, and there's also um, some pretty good evidence to suggest that this is a way that we can actually save some money. Happy to take any questions. Since you did this, have we implemented anything like this here? 
As I was finishing up my fellowship, um, the physical therapy department um, was going through some changes, and I do not think that anything has been implemented at this point, but I could be wrong. Okay. Uh, to speak to that question, we don't really have a formal program other than what we've been trying to accomplish for years, and we don't have any terminology other than I think something that the respiratory therapists who are an integral part of the mobilization of patients on a ventilator coined called dragulate. Uh, we do everything we can to get these people up out of bed mobilizing whether it's to a chair or standing or we have them still walking around the unit with tracheostomies and occasionally endotracheal tubes uh, and it's um, it depended a lot upon the uh, cooperation and the staffing of our physical therapy and our respiratory therapists. Uh, you know, it seems like we're constantly in crisis mode, having enough therapists and uh, uh, on both sides of the equation from physical therapy and respiratory therapy. But I would just like to congratulate Dr. Wilkes on a great talk. It's uh, very rewarding to see a resident enter an area of training and get a intense interest and dig down and become a paper quote and expert on something like this. Uh, and the question I have for you, I think the uh, UAB paper that you mentioned early on uh, in the literature series was from Birmingham, if I'm not mistaken, and I was wondering if you know what the uh, climate's like where you're going and do you see any obstacles to uh, what you want to do there or are they already drinking the Kool-Aid on this? Um. There's going to be room for me to do lots of things. <laughs> I think it's going to be right. Remember, uh, one of the things we try to espouse here in our training programs is building inroads and not silos. So don't go down there and beat up on everybody. No, I, I think that I've, I've seen that's not a good way to get things done either. <clears throat> well, to the overall uh, effect of health care, I mean, one of the things that, that we have as everyone knows, it's been highly publicized about our overcrowding issues in the emergency room and, as all of you know, delays in getting beds for patients, and that's affected by throughput. And so these, those issues about length of stay, <clears throat> as Dr. Sharp very appropriately pointed out, it is a business issue, but that is a business issue of the hospital that, in, in the case now with overcrowding, actually affects patient care. So that it, it said that while those things did not reach statistical significance frequently, they did reach probably clinical significance because that would be one more day of a bed that would have been available for somebody in a, in an IC, in, that's holding in the emergency room or in our case, uh, E-Safe. So, uh, or that's not it, E-Star, e E-Stars. So, um, you know, I think those, these are the kinds of things that really do have a major impact, even if they've had no other clinical the effect could still be worthwhile. And I especially appreciate the fact that it was cheaper. That was good. I want to point out something to everybody that I should have said earlier. This is the first time Dr. Hedrick's been at well, at least the Grand Rounds that, that, uh, that I've been at since we found out he received a national teaching award from the Society of Thoracic Surgery for his uh, efforts in education and teaching, and you guys have been a substantial beneficiary of that, and Robbie, I want to thank you in front of everybody for that. Thank you very much. Great, great job today, guys. This is uh, it's a great talk. Again, uh, thank you very much, Gavin. And that's, uh, I'm sure I'm glad you saved at least this one. I, I, believe I'd, I believe I'd get another computer and save it somewhere else. We'll see everybody tonight. Thank you. Good job. We'll have to uh, have you come back and give your peptic ulcer talk I will, if you, you know, ever I was, resurrected. I was thinking about that. I was like, God, I could come back and give a good talk one day.